All right, good afternoon, everyone. I am uh, Council Member Rafael Salamanca. I'm the Chair of the Subcommittee on Planning, Dispositions, and Concessions. Welcome to today's hearing. We are joined today by Council Member Mealy, Council Member Cohen, and Council Member Traeger. Uh, before we begin, I would like to thank all the members of the public who have joined us for today's hearing. This hearing is being televised and is broadcast online. The Council is committed to providing open access to the public for, all, for our hearings and meetings, along with open space. We want to ensure that our public disclosure is respectful of all perspectives and viewpoints. Because of this, please refrain from any interruption or outburst during this meeting. Any such interruptions may include, but not limited to, clapping, booing, heckling, attempts to draw out council members and members of the public testifying. Please be advised that disruptions of this meeting will be grounds for me to instruct the Sergeant of Arms to remove anyone who is creating such disruption. We ask that we have a civil and respectful dialogue and thank you for your respect and cooperation. So today we'll be holding hearings on the Bedford Union Armory application and the Lower East Side Inclusionary Housing Tax Exemption application. All the other items on the calendar will be laid over. We will start today's hearing with an application by the HPD for a tax exemption pursuant to Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law for, pro for property located at 377 East 10th Street and 544 East 13th Street in Council Member Mendez's district in Manhattan. And uh, Council Member Mendez, would you uh, like to give an opening statement? Okay, no worries. So now I'm opening up the public hearing on pre-considered LU, uh, Lower East Side Inclusionary uh, Housing Tax Exemption. And uh, Mr. Speaker, please introduce yourself. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. My name is Jordan Press. I'm Executive Director for Development and Planning in HPD's Government Affairs Unit. This pre-considered item consists of an exemption area located at 377 East 10th Street and 544 East 13th Street in Manhattan Council District 2 and is known as the Lower East Side Inclusionary Housing Project. This project is an amendment to a UDAP disp disposition approved by the City Council on June 26, 2002 for the conveyance of two buildings to the current sponsor, the Urban Homesteading Assistance Board, or UHAB. In 2015, the sponsor closed on a participation loan and received a J-51 tax exemption and abatement in order to completely rehabilitate this property. The developer of the project has also applied to participate in HPD's inclusionary housing program, which will allow the buildings to exceed their as of right floor area in exchange for permanent affordable housing. As such, all of the units in this project will remain subject to rent and income restrictions in perpetuity as governed by the two executed inclusionary housing regulatory agreements that run with the land. Proceeds from the sale of the floor area bonus will be used to pay down the construction loan on the buildings and after permanent loan closing, the project will convert to cooperatives in accordance with previously executed agreements. In total, there are 26 units with a mix of studios, one, two, and three bedroom apartments. Rehabilita rehabilitation has concluded in which the buildings were taken down to their studs, completely rebuilt with new roofs, windows, heating systems, kitchens, bathrooms, new layouts, and an elevator added to 544 East 13th Street. The uh, household income AMIs are 80% uh, and below, and rents range fr um, from 716 for a studio to 1067 for a three-bedroom unit. There is one commercial space at 337 East 10th Street that is currently vacant. In order to help preserve the affordability of the units, HPD is before the planning subcommittee seeking full Article 11 tax benefits retroactive to December 2015. The term of the tax exemption will coincide with the 40-year regulatory agreement. Council Member Mendez has been briefed. We have a few final details to work out, uh, but we uh, look forward to uh, gaining her final support for the project. Uh, thank you, Mr. Press. Uh, Council Member Mendez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Press. You're looking at me like you don't know what I'm going to say next, right? Um, I was. Uh, wondering how we're doing on working out those little details that we met about two weeks ago? Are we making some headway? Where is the problem? Yep, um, so the issue relates to the resale. Uh, the, the ability of the residents who lived in the building previously, they've been relocated and will move back and have the opportunity to become uh, cooperative shareholders. Um, HPD, in accordance with our home ownership programs, has resale restrictions on 
um, how much uh, return a, um, a shareholder can take as years go by. And we've heard the concerns that the uh, prospective shareholders have about wanting to accelerate that process, uh, particularly for those who might be elderly or infirm. Uh, we just received a proposal from them uh, just a couple days ago. Um, our legal team has some concerns about it. We, we hope to be able to arrive at some agreement uh, that, that meets their concerns and the concerns of, of our attorneys. Okay, uh, thank you. I just uh, want to go on the record as saying that um, I am very grateful to have worked with HPD to make sure that these buildings remain permanently affordable and that there will be uh, resale restrictions with, if we can get through those issues for those infirmed individuals, um, that would be great. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, it, I wish this was a project I could have supported earlier. Um, we talked about it at the beginning of this legislative term. My issues was about the air rights that were being created through the inclusionary uh, housing program and, and the fact that these air rights were unrestricted. And um, for me, these air rights usually, in my district, these air rights usually end up in the hands of developers who have caused a lot of ill to tenants in other buildings. So um, I am grateful to see that these uh, squatters um, who were offered home ownership back in 2001 with my predecessor, Margarita Lopez, that we're finally going to make home ownership a reality and that will make it permanently affordable going forward. So. Thank you, Mr. Press. Thank you, HPD. Uh, Donald, not the Donald, but Donald. Thank you for doing the renovations and getting this building ready for these individuals who've been waiting a long, long time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Council Member. Are there any more members of the public who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on this pre-considered LU. <laughs> All right, just uh, we're just going to take a one-minute uh, recess, please. Okay, so we're back online. So our next hearing will be LUs 808 through 812, the Bedford Union Army applications. Today we are holding a public hearing on LUs 808, 809, 810, 811, and 812, the Bedford Union Army proposal in Councilmember Lori Cumbo's district. In this application, the New York City Economic Development Corporation is seeking a zoning map amendment from R6 to R7-2 slash C2-4, a, spe a special permit for a large-scale plan, a special permit to reduce parking requirements, a zoning text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area, and approval for the disposition of city-owned property. If approved, these actions will facilitate the redevelopment of the city-owned Bedford Union Armory into a recreation center, community facility, nonprofit office space, and approximately 400 units of housing. 50% of the housing is proposed to become it is proposed to be income restricted and the remaining is proposed to be market rate. 
This project intends to transform a vacant piece of city property into an indoor recreation center with low cost community access. This is a worthy goal in a community that has been historically undeserved by quality recreation facilities. However, the housing proposed as part of this development has been a source of concern, and these are concerns that I share. In recent years, housing prices have increased dramatically in Crown Heights, threatening to displace long-time residents from their homes. In this extent, the administration must approach development on public land very carefully to ensure that we use our public resources to truly benefit our local communities and help address this housing crisis. With less and less public land across the city, we need to maximize the public benefit from the little we have left. We know that this project has been a continuous one, but we ask that everyone remain respectful of others' times to testify so that everyone's voices can be heard. As for our normal rules, please hold applause or disruptions during others' testimony. We will first hear from the applicant, then from panels of five speakers, alternating panels in favor and in opposition. But first, we'd like to go to my colleague, uh, Council Member Lori Combo, for a statement. Thank you, Chair Salamanca. I'd like to begin by thanking all of the members of the community that are here today and the public that have taken their time out to express their thoughts, their opinions, and their concerns about what is going to be one of the most important hearings that we've had here in the City Council. I also want to thank all of those that have helped to prepare for today's hearing as I am currently on maternity leave. This is one of the important events that are happening um, in the City Council, and I certainly wanted to be here to express my thoughts and my opinions as well as my concerns. I applaud you all throughout this entire process for making your voices heard on this developmental proposal that is so important to the future of our neighborhood. Community discussions about the Bedford Union Armory began over six years ago, and I was proud to be there with so many of you that are in this room today because we cannot let such a huge opportunity pass us by without our input and our feedback because future generations are depending upon us. At the start, Housing was seen as secondary to this goal. As a result, the administration developed a project framework where housing would help fund the development of the state of art recreational center. Unfortunately, we are living in a very different world. Since 2010, the average rent in Crown Heights has increased by well over 20%. Many are experiencing rents that are now doubling in our community. Many people are being pushed out of their current homes. People that have been longtime residents of the Crown Heights community are seeing wealth, development, growth, and prosperity pass them by as they are being pushed out of their homes with no opportunities available to them. We here in the City Council hear your frustrations and live them as well. Market rate rents are now far out of the reach for longtime residents who built and sustained this community. Many in development, such as Tivoli Towers and Ebbets Field, who have raised their families here, now have children who cannot afford to live in the very neighborhoods that they grew up in. They are being pushed out and forced into other communities. Many of those in rent-stabilized apartments are facing pressure and harassment as landlords create unscrupulous characteristics and, and situations where tenants are pushed out because of the lack of heat, hot water, rats, roaches, all of these different sorts of things that they allow to balloon out of control, forcing many residents out of their homes. Development of affordable housing on public land is one of the most important tools we have to address this housing affordability crisis. The Bedford Union Armory is a huge opportunity on public land for us to address these issues. This is why what we are doing here today is so critical. Our community is in a state of emergency. Our community is in a state of crises. We have a homeless shelter epidemic and many parts of central Brooklyn are feeders to that homeless shelter. We need to make sure that we address that through this particular project. We have a lack of safe recreational spaces for our youth. We have unemployment that can be seen up and down the streets in front of Ebbets Field, in front of Tivoli Towers, where we see so many young men and women 
outside with nothing to do and no place to go. The model that we have in front of us today, a model of housing with luxury condominiums used to subsidize the development of a recreational center is simply out of step with reality. Let me state clearly from the start, I oppose the proposal that is in front of us today. Over six years ago, through a series of conversations, we came together as a community and stated that we wanted a recreational facility, affordable housing, space for not-for-profit organizations, and space for the community to be able to utilize for different programs and events, as well as an opportunity to bring the community together for educational opportunities. I support that plan. I do not support the economic model that is being utilized to achieve that plan, and that is why we are here today. I will reject this application unless I can secure a project that at baseline has no market rate condos or luxury condominiums. There will be no sale of the Bedford Union Armory. This is a public facility, it's a public space, and must remain so. Any project has to have genuine and deep affordability that is reflective of the incomes of the Crown Heights community. Not Westchester, not upstate New York, not the Upper East Side. It has to reflect Crown Heights. It has to provide as much affordable housing as is financially possible. We must achieve this goal without sacrificing any other community benefits of this project. We have to make sure that a world-class recreational facility is not achieved through luxury condominiums that are gonna push out the very constituents and residents that we are looking to serve. Crown Heights deserves a state-of-the-art recreational center with affordable memberships and programming that doesn't last just for one year, but indefinitely through the life of the project. Crown Heights not-for-profit organizations deserve affordable office space so they can remain in our community. And Crown Heights deserves truly affordable housing that can help ease the impacts of rising rents. It's a high bar, but this community deserves no less. We have been in negotiations for over a year, and yet, the de Blasio administration continues to go through hearing after hearing, having the community sit through the same plan time and time again. Our community needs answers, and we need them now. Four years ago, Bill de Blasio ran on a campaign mantra of a tale of two cities. When we think about the Bedford Union Armory putting luxury condominiums in the middle of a highly gentrifying community exacerbates that tale of two cities. It doesn't bring two communities closer. It forces one out only to bring another one in. We are here today to once again hear from the administration and the developer on their vision for the armory, to challenge this vision where it continues to sh fall short of our values, and most importantly, to hear from all of you who have taken this day to participate in determining the future of your city and your neighborhood. And I just want to take time just to read one statement very quickly. This was a letter that was written to me on April 12, 2017, from Beverly Newsom, who is the president of the Ebbetsfield Tenants Association that represents over 10,000 families living together. It says, good morning, council member. Yesterday I heard, and it's dated April 12th, yesterday I heard a disturbing report. A tenant came in from work Sunday, saw approximately 20 to 30 people loitering in the basement quote unquote, smoking weed and drinking. It appeared they had set a motorcycle and truck on fire. According to the story, FDNY was called by the same tenant, not security. We are unsure as to why the basement of Ebbetsfield Apartments has become the place for this type of activity, but it is dangerous for everyone. The activities have escalated and the group has increased in size. This has been discussed many times before. Ebbetsville security needs to be empowered to do more than watch property. People's lives are at stake. They also need to be supplemented by professionals. Sincerely, Beverly Newsom. I read that to you so that we can have a context of the understanding of the community in which we are living in right now. There are so many important and emergency needs that are happening, and we are losing our youth simultaneously while all of the debates, while all of the rallies, while all of the discussions, as a council member over the last four years, because of that, we have never been able to come to a consensus to build or vote on or support any affordable or low-income housing in the community. And while we are fighting, our youth are suffering, 
We are not building any affordable or low-income housing. We are a community in crisis where the unemployment rate has ballooned to such an extent that you see it in our homeless shelters. I hope today, at today's hearing, that we are able to hear each other and to have discussion and to try and work together to create the best possible solution and outcome because time is of the essence and we are in a state of emergency. We need to hold the de Blasio administration accountable. We need to hold Mayor de Blasio accountable to achieving what we call one New York City, where we don't have luxury condominiums taking over public spaces that are our greatest and most valuable resource. I thank all of you here today. I look forward to this hearing. I look forward to your testimony. And I look forward to us being able to come together to achieve the best possible outcomes for our future. They are depending upon us. Thank you, Chair Salamanca. Thank you, Council Member Combo. Uh, just want to recognize that we've been uh, joined by Council Member Idonis Rodriguez. Um, and just for a point of clarification, if you feel the need to clap, just wave your hands. Um, if you don't agree with what they're saying, you can just put your thumbs down up in the air. Okay? All right. I will now open up the public hearings to LUs 808, 809, 810, 811, and 812. We will call up the first panel. Uh, we have Mr. James uh, Patchett, uh, President of EDC. You can come up, sir. Uh, Lydia Downing, EDC Senior Vice President. Jane, I'm um, John Vajaderes. I say that right? Oh, there we go. BFC Partners. Donald Kaposha, BFC Partners. And Eric Woodland, BFC Partners. Good afternoon, Chair Salamanca, and members of the Subcommittee on Planning, Dispositions, and Concessions. My name is James Patchett, and I am President and CEO of the New York City Economic Development Corporation. I am joined by Lydia Downing, Senior Vice President for Government and Community Relations. At EDC, it is our mission to create shared prosperity across New York City's five boroughs by strengthening neighborhoods and growing good jobs. The proposed redevelopment of Bedford Arm Armory advances this mission by transforming a vacant building into an affordable and accessible community asset that serves residents of Crown Heights. Inspired and initiated by the vision of local leaders like former Congressman Major Owens, this project would preserve and restore the historic building as a state-of-the-art recreation facility, cultural and community office space, and a flexible event space, all of which will offer deeply affordable rents and rates. The project will also produce hundreds of units of mixed income housing, including permanently affordable housing units. I'll touch on each of these components in more detail, but first I'd like to talk quickly about the history of the project and how community has informed this proposal. In 2011, after military operations ended at the armory, a group of local elected officials called on the city and state to transform the vastly underutilized property into a valuable community asset. Specifically, the elected officials proposed redeveloping the armory as a multi-purpose community center, leveraging market rate housing as the site, at the site to offset construction and operating costs. In response, the state relinquished use of the building in 2013. At the city's discretion, EDC then issued a request for proposals for, an, for a financially feasible project that would deliver community-serving uses, preserve historic character, incorporate sustainability, and create jobs for local residents. Prior to developer selection, EDC engaged in robust outreach to better understand the community's goals for the armory. EDC and local elected officials co-hosted roundtable round discussions with 23 community organizations and held two large public meetings with nearly 250 community members in attendance. Based on this outreach, EDC negotiated a product, project that reflected community priorities, including conversion to a ground lease structure for the community space to maintain city own ownership and guarantee ongoing community benefits, establishment of a large recreational facility and auditorium with flexibility to accommodate the neighborhood's diverse needs and run by a capable neutral operator, housing units spanning a wide range of income bands and unit sizes, 
an emphasis on historical preservation and neighborhood context. In December 2015, EDC and local elected officials announced the selection of BFC partners to redevelop the site because its proposed proposal best fitted the RFP's goals and the community's priorities. The three main components of that project are a recreational facility, nonprofit office and event space, and affordable housing. I'll now speak to each component in turn. First, the heart of this project is a state-of-the-art recreation facility that includes three full-size basketball courts, a six-lane swimming pool, and a number of multi-sport surfaces. This recreational facility will be truly affordable to the Crown Heights community and remain affordable throughout the full 99-year life of the lease. That means families with lower incomes will have access to the fitness center and courts for just $10 a month, along with discounted access to the pool and various fitness classes. We are also pleased that the recreation facility will be operated by CAMBA, a Brooklyn-based not-for-profit organization. They will be partnering with a host of other nonprofit programming providers, and BFC will provide greater detail on that programming in just a few minutes. The second component of the project will provide modern office space to a number of local community and cultural organizations at deeply affordable rates. Specifically, these nonprofit tenants will pay $6 per square foot in rent. That is approximately 20% of the market rate for office space in that community. This will ensure that these organizations can continue to deliver important services and programs to Crown Heights long into the future. The project also features a 5,000 square foot event space. This will be a flexible space that can, be, that can accommodate a wide range of events and uses, and it will be made available to community organizations at affordable rates. The third component of the project is affordable housing. As you know, this administration is laser focused on addressing New York City's affordable housing crisis. Mayor de Blasio recently announced an expansion of his affordable housing plan with a commitment to create and preserve 300,000 units of affordable housing over the next decade. The Armory Project will deliver 165 affordable units at very low and moderate income levels. It also includes market rate housing that is intended to cross subsidize not just the affordable housing, but also the below market rate recreation center and office space. We are aware that Council Member Combo, along with local leader, leaders, members of the Crown Heights community, and many people here today, have real genuine concerns about certain elements of the housing plan especially market rate condos. We take those concerns very seriously. Our condo policy is something we are currently reevaluating, not only in the context of the specific project, but going forward in the policy we will apply to all citywide projects on city-owned land. And we will continue to work with Councilmember Combo to address her concerns and those of the community that are very heartily felt about this project. Finally, we are committed to ensuring the long-term affordability and accountability of this project. The city's ground lease with BFC includes a system of incentives, penalties, reporting, and enforcement mechanisms to ensure the delivery of community benefits. That includes free or discounted user fees for individuals, free or discounted facility rentals for local organizations, and reduced rents on office space for not-for-profits. Every year, the development team must provide EDC with an independently audited report that details the delivery of community benefits. A community benefit only counts as delivered when an individual or organization actually uses the facilities. In other words, community benefits are based on true value to the community, not just what the development team makes available. I'm happy to provide more detail on the city's enforcement mechanisms during the question and answer period. In closing, EDC strongly believes that activating the Bedford Union Armory as a world-class recreation center and community facility will provide exciting and affordable opportunities for Crown Heights residents. Not only does it respond to pressing community needs, it will continue to deliver community benefits for decades to come. I look forward to taking your questions and to working with the council towards a project that we can all support. But first, I'd like to turn over the presentation to the BFC team who will walk us through some additional project details. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Council Members, Chair Salamanca, Council Member Combo. Thank you for the opportunity to have my team and I present this project today. My name is Donald Kaposian. I'm Principal and BFC Partners. We were designated by EDC to redevelop the Brooklyn Union, the Bedford Union Armory. 
We appreciate the opportunity to be here today and present our proposal. I'm joined here today by members of my team, including Jonathan Marvel from Marvel Architects and Lisa Gaon from Canva, who is our nonprofit partner and future operator of the Rec and Recreation and Community Center. From my team, we have Wynn Warden, the Director of Development, John Valadares, Project Manager, Eric Woodland, Director of Recreational Community Facilities, and he headed up our community engagement process as well. The current Bedford Union Armory, completed in the early part of the 20th century, consists of several components that we will refer to during this, during this presentation. The historic original structure consists of three components. If you'll notice on the screen, uh, the first is the drill shed, the iconic uh, tall barrel vault with the iconic tall barrel vaulted ceiling. Then we have the three-story head house along Bedford Avenue, which is the administrative annex to the drill shed, the former stables along President Street, and a fourth component is the maintenance garage closest to Roger Street, which, is not, which was not constructed as part of the original armory. We are proposing to convert the Bedford Union Armory into a mixed-use development. The Armory's restored drill shed and head house will be converted into recreational and community facilities that will collectively benefit tens of thousands of Central Brooklyn residents. This includes a year-round accessible state-of-the-art recreation center, 386 new units of quality housing including 178 affordable homes, and community office, event, and educational space. The concept of the recreation center at the Armory was initially proposed by Congressman Major Owens, who is a strong proponent of converting the Armory into a recreation center to address Central, Central Brooklyn's longstanding struggle with public health and fitness issues, as well as higher rates of violence that have plagued and continue to plague the area. We have heard from many community members who strongly support the recreation center for these reasons. Namely, Crown Heights residents need accessible, quality athletic space for all young people in and all young people in the neighborhood need a safe place to go after school to continue developing athletic, educational, and community-oriented skills. Under our proposal, the, ma the majority of the armory would be conveyed under a 99-year ground lease, which enables us to provide up to $1.5 million, million worth of annual community benefits. These community benefits will come in many forms, including free or discounted access to the recreation portion of the project, sports and recreation programming for youth and senior citizens, and deeply discounted office space to local nonprofits that provide educational, cultural, and advocacy services to the local community. Our proposal would outfit the iconic drill hall with three full-size wood basketball courts, multi-purpose sports services, capable of accommodating diverse sport, sporting opportunities in a six-lane, 25-meter competitive swimming pool. The facility will be managed by CAMBA, a nonprofit organization serving Brooklyn since 1977. In addition to CAMBA, we have hired a director of operations to run the residential portion of the project. Eric Woodland, to my right, joins us, joins us with extensive experience in having successfully run the Boys and Girls Clubs of New Rochelle and, Harlem, and the Harlem Junior Tennis Program. Just as impactful as the recreation center is the proposed community facility space in the head house, which will pre be preserved and used as a hub for nonprofits in the neighborhood. Our proposal features a flexible community meeting space capable of accommodating up to 500 people and also features a significant amount of much needed office space for nonprofits serving Crown Heights. These nonprofits provide important cultural, educational, and advocacy services to their constituents, including many thousands of local residents from vulnerable and underserved populations. To date, some of the key proposed tenants include the West Indian American Carnival Association, Brooklyn Community Pride Center, Ifatayo Cultural Arts Academy, and Digital Girl, Inc. None of these organizations I just mentioned have a permanent home or facilities to meet the needs of their constituents. Instead, they currently work from their kitchen tables, pay high rents in commercial storefronts, or operate in makeshift or borrowed space. The Armory will become a permanent home to these nonprofits at a very low rate of $6 per square foot per year. The condominium component will total 56 units. 20% of those units will be marketed to families earning no greater than 120% of New York City's uh, AMI. Uh, the prices will be set so that buyers do not pay more than approximately 30% of their income to mortgage and carrying costs. There will be a mix of studios, one, two, and three bedroom units. 
The final component of the project is a proposed mixed-use, mixed-income rental building, which will include 330 units, a 118-car parking garage, and 25,000 square feet of community facility space. 166 of these rental units, or 50 percent of the apartments, will be set aside as affordable to low- and middle-income families with income bands ranging from 37 percent to 100 percent of AMI. The proposed project will exceed the City's MIH requirements. 30 percent of the units will be permanently affordable under the City's uh, MIH program. The remaining affordable units, MIH is mandatory inclusionary housing for those who don't know MIH. The remaining affordable units will the re remaining affordable units will be affordable under a regulatory agreement for 30 years. After the 30-year period, the ground lease includes provisions that incentive, uh, incentivize us to extend the affordability, which is something we have done on other on other affordable projects. In addition to the recreational community facility and affordable housing programs, there are additional significant preservation and sustainability goals. The proposed development will preserve 85 percent of the historic armory, armory structure, and we have entered into a letter of resolution with the New York State Historic Preservation Office and the New York City Landmarks Commission during our preservation, detailing our preservation efforts. In terms of sustainability, we have committed to achieving lead silver or better on the residential building and will include elements that you typically find in other LEEDS buildings, including low flow faucets, energy efficient appliances, lighting, more effective windows and insulation. In addition, we are proposing solar panels on the roof and an on-site cogeneration plant that will supply the project with electricity, hot and chilled water for heating and cooling. The final aspect that I'd like to speak to you about today is our commitment to working with minority and women-owned businesses and hiring locally. We are, committed to, we are committed to supporting the growth and development of MWBE contractors and to hiring locally from the community. We have set a goal of 25 percent MWBE utilization for construction and have committed to using New York, City, New York City's Hire NYC program for local hiring both during construction and for ongoing operations. All employees will be paid a living wage and we have reached an agreement with 32BJ Building Service Workers Union to provide building service personnel for the residential portions of the project. We hired a third party consultant early in the development process to assist us in achieving these goals. Manny Burgos is the principal of By the Numbers Consulting Services, a leading provider of compliance and supportive services to housing and commercial developers, construction contractors, suppliers and property managers. Manny's company is a 100 percent minority owned firm headquartered in Brooklyn, New York and works throughout New York State. We have engaged uh, Manny's company, BTN Consulting, to conduct specialized outreach in central Brooklyn for the project's MWBE and Higher NYC compliance, as well as conduct local outreach events throughout the development process, including job fairs and MWBE capacity building workshops. To date, Manny and his team have already hosted several Get Certified events and other information sessions to prepare local contractors. Thank you. Any other speakers there? Yeah. No? <clears throat> All right. Well, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Um, a few questions. Uh, in terms of um, in many past projects of this nature, the city has sold the property to developers. Why is uh, EDC deciding to give uh, a 99-year lease instead of selling the property? Right. So. The, uh, to be clear, the proposal before you today includes a small component uh, that would sell the element of the project that would include condos on, the, on that segment that would be actually be sold to the developer. The full remainder of the project is subject to a 99-year ground lease. Um, that came out of specific concerns from the community that they wanted to see the, commu the community and recreation space held by the public sector for the long term so as to guarantee uh, that those benefits could be provided. How much is the uh, developer going to pay EDC a month for the lease? Uh, the, the, the lease includes a full um, annual payment of $2 million uh, for the lease, but the uh, a significant portion of that is available to be abated contingent on their provision of community benefits like the ones we've been discussing today. All right. um, let's say that the developer 
What consequences is there if the developer, you know, they violate the terms of the lease? Right, absolutely. So we, you know, we take the, the community benefits that are, provided, that are provided by this project very seriously. Uh, and as a result, we have built in significant and strong enforcement mechanisms. Specifically, what that means is to the extent that developer fails to conform to the requirements here, such as the $6 per square foot, square, per square foot rent for office space or for providing affordable uh, space at the recreation center, there are significant financial penalties and ultimately the city has the ability to terminate the lease um, and take the property back into public ownership to ensure that a future operator could provide the benefits that were originally guaranteed. All right. Um, you know, in following this project, um, I've noticed that members of the community have, would rather see that this property be developed by a community-based not-for-profit. Why was a not-for-profit not considered and a for-profit considered? Absolutely. So the, the, the original goals um, that were articulated from the community and extended community engagement process that, it, that um, was prior to the selection of the developer focused primarily on the benefits we've been discussing today. The need for affordable recreation space and the need for affordable um, office space for local not-for-profits and event space. Based on that feedback, we evaluated the proposals that were provided at the time, and the one that was most responsive was the one that was provided by BFC, which is a for-profit developer. Since that time, BFC has uh, created partnerships with local uh, not-for-profit development CDCs to ensure that there is a community voice as a part of the development project. All right. Can you uh, walk us through your thinking as to why market rate condos are appropriate on city-owned land? Absolutely. Well, as, as I mentioned, Council Member, it's, it's, and it's, a, it's a very important topic of discussion. Uh, the original mechanism and logic for including the market rate condos was that they would provide value that would pay for the significant uh, improvements that are necessary to make the, the, the recreation center viable. This is an old facility and is in need of significant capital improvements in order to make it better. And based on the research uh, that was done in extended community outreach, people were very focused on ensuring there was a rec center. And as you can imagine, a facility of this size and age requires substantial improvements. And so the thinking at the time was that market rate condos would be a way of developing proceeds to be able to pay for those needs. As Council Member Combo has indicated today, and as we've heard from the community repeatedly, that is a significant concern. And we take that very seriously. We're evaluating that policy at EDC as to whether we should be ever in a circumstance where we're, where we're selling for market rate condos on city-owned property. And furthermore, the mayor is seriously considering this policy on a citywide basis and whether it's appropriate in any circumstances for the city to be providing uh, condos on city-owned property. All right. I am going to hand over to uh, Council Member uh, Combo for questions. Thank you, Chair Salamanca. I uh, wanted to continue in the same line of questioning as Chair Salamanca. Uh, Mr. Patchett, you stated in your testimony that on the fourth page, as you know, this administration is laser focused on addressing New York City's affordable housing crisis. Mayor de Blasio recently announced an expansion of his affordable housing plan with a commitment to create and preserve 300 units of affordable housing over the next decade. You continue to go on to say that the Armory Project will deliver 165 affordable units at very low and moderate levels. Mm -hmm. How do you define very low and moderate levels? Absolutely. Because in the proposal um, that Mr. Kaposha put forward, it's showing that the vast majority of housing that's going to be created on the rental side is way outside of the income levels of the residents of Crown Heights. And I just want to state my community in particular, we have the second highest voter turnout in the city of New York, which means my community is very engaged. They are very intelligent. They are very wise people who are following the dynamics of their community. 
There may be other communities that don't have the opportunity to be able to follow, to watch, to critique in the same way. I'm fortunate that we are able to do so. And so you may be able to put forward something like this and maybe some people don't notice, but in this community, they notice. Mm -hmm. So how is it that you're able to say 165 affordable units at very low and moderate levels when the vast majority of the affordability, and that's just the affordability, there's a whole section of it that's market rate. How do you come to that conclusion? Right, absolutely, council member. And I, I absolutely appreciate um, your points and your community is absolutely a very engaged one um, and they've made their voices heard very clearly throughout this process and you have been you know, a, a very clear advocate in emphasizing to us the concerns in the community. And we've heard very clearly from you that the average income in this community is $42,000 a year, which in city speak translates into 50% of area median income, which is low income. So the, the definitions in my testimony tie to the definitions used by federal housing policy, but I absolutely take your point that you know, there is a need to continue to look at the affordability here and ensure that there are units that are, a significant number of units that are truly affordable to your community, and we hope to continue those conversations with you. I'm hearing in the last few questions, uh, your response has been very much, we're looking into, mm -hmm. we hear you, we've heard, but we, as a council are not seeing. Yes. So I understand that you're seeing, you're hearing, you're understanding, you're working towards, mm -hmm. but this project is coming down to the wire and we've yet to see the results of what you've seen, what you've heard, what you've understood. When we're talking about market rate housing, when we're talking about luxury condominiums, mm -hmm. and we're hearing that there are these policies that potentially could be formalized or not formalized, I wanna be clear that the thinking, the hearing, and the seeing are going to have to translate into something in order for this proposal to even be considered. And for you to come today towards this city council and this body and the community, people have taken off from work, people that can't afford to take off from work, and to still be in a place of hearing and seeing and considering is really inappropriate to the people that have come here today who want to hear about a better project that's more reflective of the goals of the community. I want to go on to, um, to talk more about the recreational facility as well, um, and perhaps BFC can answer and weigh in on this. What is the annual membership going to be for the recreational facility? How are families going to be able to afford to utilize it? Uh, what is going to be, what measures are going to be put in place to make sure that there are no introductory offers where the first year or two, everyone's there having a great time. By year five, by year 10, it's no longer affordable to the residents that live at, say, Ebbets Field or Tivoli Towers um, initially. How do we ensure that the recreational facility remains affordable for the life of the project? Sure. So thank you, Councilmember. I'll let BFC speak to that question as well. But just from the city's perspective, um, yeah. the, 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 there will be a $10 monthly fee for being a member of the rec center for community members. In addition, there will be other benefits to uh, provide, make sure that there are classes and other important access, including the youth programming uh, that is critical to this. Um, and those will all be built into the project. The way that we will ensure that is That's through- That's the million is, dollar question. Yes, the way that we will ensure that is through strong enforcement mechanisms in our contract, which provide for substantial monetary defaults and ultimately the ability to take the property back if BFC continues to provide these benefits, not just for five years or 10 years, but for 99 years, the full duration of this program. I'll let BFC speak to uh, their thoughts as well. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> Yeah, uh, President Padgett is accurate, and we do would, would have to suffer major penalties in the loss of the property if we were to default under the ground lease. The ground lease does require that we provide community benefit, and part of that community benefit is making sure the community residents have a, a access to this facility, and for $10, $10 a month is the, the, the number that we've agreed to. What about for a family membership? $10 sounds great, but if you have three or four in your family, that adds up to $40, $50 a month, uh, $600 a year, depending on what is your family size and scale. Mm -hmm. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give that to John Valadares. He's been 
looking closely at the underwriting of the operations of the drill shed. Sure. Thank you for the question. Our goal is to ensure uh, that we're providing a, a rec center and community facility that is accessible to all in the community. Uh, we're looking into family membership rates that we provide, but it's important to point out that a number of the, the majority of the access to the armory will be through programs that currently exist um, through nonprofit partners that simply do not have the facilities they need in order to provide these services to constituents. And I'll give, an, I'll give a couple of examples. Um, our basketball court provider uh, or partner is New Heights, a basketball AAU program and mentorship program. Um, they graduate 200 kids through their program every year, middle school and high schoolers. Um, they currently are spread across three boroughs, basketball courts all over the city, um, and they could only, they're tapped out of 200 members. Um, their programs are 100% free to their students. That inc includes um, the basketball program, mentorship programs, tutoring programs. Um, uh, through our partnership with New Heights, we believe and they believe that they'll be able to at least double the program uh, that they're currently providing and have committed to a Brooklyn focus for new entrants into that program. So by being able to provide a nonprofit user with facility space, they're going to be able to continue to offer um, and grow their programming to offer space to more people in the community. Oops. My great concern with that, and I apologize for cutting you off, but my great concern is that this recreational facility is available first and foremost to the youth of Crown Heights. What mechanisms do you have in place to make sure that they are prioritized, that they have an opportunity to be there, that they are first and foremost um, given the opportunity to utilize the recreational facility? As John said, our goal here is just what you exactly stated, is that we want to serve the community. I've said from the very beginning of this project, it's a great honor to be able to build here, to be able to build 330 units of rental housing and have 165 of those be affordable, but that's just a drop in the bucket of demand and need. We see that clearly. However, we view this recreational center and headhouse as an opportunity to serve thousands in this community, and that is our goal, and that's what we want to do. With that, I want to just briefly touch upon the community engagement process that we have been through over the last year and a half in the community. It's informed what we have, how we are ultimately, or I should say, how we are currently programming the drill shed and the type of activities and, and nonprofit users will be housing there. But I'd like to f turn it over to Eric for a moment and let him just talk about sort of thousands of contacts he's made in the community. And reason is, we, we feel very strongly that we have now have a very direct line of communication with many thousands in this community. So with that, I'm going to give it to Eric. <clears throat> and I want to thank you, but I also want to remind you that part of this is what I was stating with EDC. Goals are great, but we have to understand through this hearing how those goals are going to be achieved and what are going to be the penalties if they are not achieved. Because we go through projects like this and these exercises time and time again, and after projects like this are voted on, supported on, and you go back to say these goals are not being met or achieved, places have changed, people have changed, people have moved on, jobs have moved on, we're term limited, new council members come in, and the community is the ones that are lost in all of that. So how do we ensure that the residents of Crown Heights, particularly our youth, are prioritized in the development of this project in terms of utilizing the community and recreational facility? Okay, thank you, Councilman. I'm sorry, I took it back from Eric, and I'll give it to him in a moment with, mm -hmm. the, with more on our community engagement. But just to answer your question on how, how we're gonna track closely who we are serving and how much we are serving in this community, we do have a, me a mechanism that we will put in place it is a, we, 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 we envision and we believe that as people use, everybody who uses this rec center will swipe a card. They'll have a card to swipe in. That will carry their name, their address, whether or not they're a community resident. Whether they're there for a swim lesson or to participate in New Heights basketball or simply a member of the community using some of the various uh, uh, fitness rooms that we would have available on a regular basis. At the end of every month, 
we will be able, or every day in fact, we're going to be able to track the number of people that we serve, the number of people who came from that community, and the amount of community benefit that we delivered on any particular day. We need to do this in order to be able to fully report to the city at the end of the year. And I don't want to wait, of course, until the end of the year to know whether I've delivered a million and a half in community benefit. I want to know that we're on the right track day by day and week by week. Well, I just want to add to that. That sounds good, but any project that I would consider, we're going to have to have a mechanism up front that shows either by zip code, by council district, by school district, how we are exactly going to prioritize the community and the youth of Crown Heights so that they have access to this particular space and they're not overrun by other communities that are going to recognize the, the success of what this recreational facility can be. Can you talk to us about um, the fee that you're charging relative to other fees um, that other recreational facilities provide? Have you done a cost analysis to look at other programs like the YMCA or others in terms of what their monthly membership is relative to this one? So, so first of all, I just want to respond to what you said earlier, mm -hmm. and that is when we, we what we have, uh, what we have uh, offered and what we invite and what we want is a community advisory board to help us with the questions that you just raised, to be sure that when we are programming and we, when we are accounting for our community benefit, that we're accounting for all the important criteria that this community wants to see accounted for, including, including you. So we've, we've, we've uh, put that out as something that we believe we need to help guide us through the process. With that, I'm going to turn it to Eric, who will tell you mm -hmm. a little bit about the comparative analysis between us, Y, and uh, let's say Asphalt Green. Okay. Eric, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Councilman Cumbo. Good afternoon. Councilmember Cumbo. Um, we've done a lot of research in the community. We've worked with Deborah Lam Dr. Deborah Lamb at uh, School District 17. There's over 37,000 kids in School District 17, of which 78% are on government assistance programs. So be it as it may, we're going to set nominal fees to maybe no fees for children 17 and under. Um, my plan, our plan, is to expand the amount of sports and activities that go out to the community. Um, we've learned that there are only about 66 school-age after-school care programs in Crown Heights, and there are many more that aren't, you know, licensed through New York State. So this opportunity where the most juvenile crime is committed between three and six. We offer thousands of kids, maybe even 2,000 kids a day, an opportunity to come in and, and integrate with these nonprofit programs in tennis, lacrosse, soccer, swimming, coding, and basketball. Um, we can do Megar Evers baseball. We have uh, a, a, a sort of a practice range for golf. So to expand the kids' horizons on the arts and on sports, we're definitely going to tackle that. And be it uh, as it may that 70% of the kids are on government-assisted programming, we will definitely schedule fees according to uh, their needs. Yeah. Oh, and when you, if in terms of a cost comparison, you look at the YMCA, on average, a uh, student at 12 years old and up will pay roughly $65 a month. That's 12 months times 65. If you go to Asphalt Green, you're looking at almost um, $2,000 a year for a child to play in, in those types of programs. So from nominal to $10, I think that's hitting the mark in terms of uh, kids that are getting breakfast and lunch free. And that's how we would identify kids in Crown Heights for the program. One, one, of the reasons I felt, one of the reasons that Eric came on board with us was, and we've learned a lot through this process, about, a lot about the community, a lot about rec centers. Uh, one of the things that Eric said to me very early on was, look, you have to offer a diversity of sports. If you want children to be competitive for, for, for scholarships as they get to college age, you want them to be in sort of not the typical sports, maybe golf, maybe lacrosse. There are many opportunities there for scholarships. So he really sold me on the idea of making sure we had a very diverse op sporting and athletic opportunity with this, with this, uh, with this drill shed. And then I'm going to switch gears after this one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, in working with the School District 17, Clarence Ellis and uh, Deborah Lamb, there's a big need for uh, the schools to have access to the armory during the daytime, where now you have one or two, three schools within one building sharing one gym, mm -hmm. and now they will have access to multi-sports within the armory. 
that's a very critical component to this project is that um, there are schools such as Medgar Evers uh, College Preparatory that are national track and field winners, but they do their athletic training in the cafeteria. So we want to make sure that those schools um, have opportunities to utilize and benefit um, at a low cost or free to them, rather, um, the opportunity to utilize the facility. But we have to get that in um, some sort of legal binding document because, again, we don't want it to balloon to the cost of Asphalt Green or the YMCA or any of those other programs. We want it to remain affordable to the community. But going back to um, EDC and questions around uh, affordability with housing, yes, this has been the question that has been a large part of this conversation. Um, the permanency of the affordable housing that you're discussing. Mm -hmm. So let's just say on the proposed 50% affordable housing, um, what percentage of that is considered uh, affordable and permanent affordable housing? That's the first question. The second one is based on why was a not-for-profit developer not considered? I know Council Member Salamanca touched on that, but want to know why a not-for-profit developer was not either recruited, selected, or partnered in that way? And why was a community land trust not considered the original model for how we want to develop this public property? And are there other projects that are, be, that are being looked at across the city um, utilizing the community land trust model? Great, thank you. Um, I'll go through your questions in order. Um, let me just make a note to make sure I get to all of them. You can answer them in any order you choose. No, no I just want to make sure I don't miss any. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'll make sure. <laughs> I have faith. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so the first question was about the percentage of the affordable housing that would be permanently affordable. So of the 50% affordable housing, 60% uh, of that would be permanently affordable. Um, so 60% would be permanently affordable. What does permanent mean in your definition? means permanent. It means the restriction runs. I know, but affordable means affordable, and that's not affordable. Fair enough. Uh, the, 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 the restriction it runs with the building, which is to say that the, the building permits and the construction of the project are dependent on this requirement, and to that end, it will mean in perpetuity forever it is required to be affordable. There is no mechanism uh, to get out of that benefit under any circumstances. So 60% are affordable, then let's say for 99 years? Because I heard a lot of big words. I want to break it down simply. Right, absolutely. So the so of the... Uh, of the 50% that is affordable, 60% of that is going to be permanently affordable. The remaining 40% um, will be uh, affordable for a minimum of 30 years, but up to, up to the duration of the ground lease, which is 99 years. So everyone's moving into the building. Some people can stay for 30 years, and then they have to get kicked out because they can't afford it when it jumps to... What will it jump to market rate, or will it jump? What will happen to those uh, forty percent of it, mm -hmm. of the building that will remain non-permanent? So those units would be subject to rent stabilization. So any any individuals in those uh, units would be protected. They would not be required to move out to the extent that any of the affordability restrictions. Uh, terminated, there would be rent stabilization protections for the individual tenants, meaning that they would be permanently protected as long as they were um, as long as they were living there. So explain that to me because maybe I don't know. Maybe I'm the only one not understanding. Oh, okay. So those that would the forty percent that would be permanent for thirty years after the 30 years is over, they would be permanently protected but would not have permanent housing. <laughs> no, I think, the, the, just, again, the, there are significant incentives built in to ensure that the, the units that are affordable for 30 years are affordable for significantly longer. Um, there's an HPD regulatory agreement that uh, provides for those protections, and our experience 
um, across the city has been that we are able to successfully keep those units affordable for much longer. That being I, said, mm -hmm. uh, that being said, if there were a circumstance in which the affordability restrictions terminated at the end of 30 years, the individuals or families in those units would be continued to pr be protected as long as they lived there under the terms of rent stabilization. I think the greatest incentive would be to make them all 100 percent permanently affordable. Mm -hmm. mm. But I'm going to turn over the line of questioning to my co Oh, yes, I'm sorry, I got carried away. No, Chair, no worries. Honka. Thank you, Councilmember Thumbo. Um, I have a question that I want to get out here. So just to, just to continue in terms of the affordability, um, in the area around the armory, fully half of all renters and households are severely rent burdened, mm -hmm. uh, paying more than half of their incomes to rent. Uh, and, and they're in real danger of displacement. Considering the housing crisis in central Brooklyn and in Crown Heights, why was this project not designed from the start to maximize affordability? Well, the, you know, as, as, the, as Council Member Cumbo indicated, there's no question that the city across the board, Crown Heights in particular, but across the board has been undergoing significant change. So the, as, when this project was initially developed prior to my time, the with the city, the, the project was envisioned based on community benefits, and those community benefits the community was looking for primarily were the ability to have an affordable recreation center and the ability to have affordable office space. Based on those expectations from the community, the proposal that was in front of us that was most uh, responsive to that was the BFC proposal. And that proposal did require some market rate housing in order to pay for the construction of the, of the drill hall in order to actually provide the benefits that were the priorities of the community. That being said, you know, the, the mayor recently announced a significant increase in our, the city's overall commitment to affordable housing and also provides free legal representation to any tenants that are at risk of eviction, as well as advocating for some of the strongest rent laws in the city's history, as well as consecutive years of rent freezes. And those are all significant other tools that the city is focused on to deal with the real issues of displacement that are challenges across the city and we recognize particularly acute in Crown Heights. I still think the greatest amenity will to continue to have this, to have this project 100% affordable. Um, in terms of the, um, let's talk about the term leases for the not-for-profit. How would that work? Absolutely. So the, 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 again, the, the, the not-for-profit, uh, tenants who would be, uh, who would be tenants here. Uh, are based on you know, conversations with the community as local organizations that are in need of permanent space or long-term space. The, the city's agreement with the developer requires that that space be provided at $6 per, uh, $6 per square foot in rent. That is approximately one-fifth of the cost of uh, paying for that kind of equivalent space elsewhere in the community. So we believe that's a significant financial benefit to those organizations and will help them stabilize in order to provide you know, important training programs, job placement opportunities, and cultural programming for the community. Those, lease, those leases will range in term from 10 to 30 years, and I can let BFC speak to any other specifics. So you have some of the not-for-profits that were Proposed to receive this low cost office include the Brooklyn Community Pride Center, the Digital Girls Inc., uh, Fetayo uh, Cultural Arts Academy, New Heights Youth, and the West Indian American Day Carnival Association. How were these not for profits selected? The, uh, well, I just say, the, generally speaking, across the board, uh, this has been part of a community outreach process, and they were selected based on conversations and priorities that were identified by the local community and the local elected officials to both the city and to the developer. And you said that this $6 a square foot rate will at least will be for how many years? That the lease determines vary from 10 to 30 years, um, but the the that's with these individual organizations depending on their specific needs. But the requirement that the office space be affordable at that rate is 
lasts for the entire 99 years of the ground lease, subject only to increases in inflation. All right, and let's say one of these not-for-profits leaves. Will that rate remain the same for a new not-for-profit coming in? Yes. All right. And will the community event room be available to the public at reasonable cost? For yes. So the, ev the event space, which is, I know is an important issue in the community, as it is in many communities throughout the city, that space is being managed by the not-for-profit CAMBA, which is a Brooklyn-based, uh, again, not-for-profit job place placement organization. They will be managing that space and ensuring, again, they are not-for-profit and they will be uh, providing it out to local community organizations based on their needs at very affordable rates. All right, thank you. I just want to recognize we've been joined by Chairman uh, Greenfield. Uh, so I'm going to hand it over to uh, um, Council Member Traeger. Thank you very much, Chair. And uh, I also want to commend my colleague, Council Member Cumbo, for uh, really her leadership on this and, and I think her very effective questioning. I I'd like to just uh, go over a couple of things, uh, Director Patchett. Uh, this is city property, is that correct? That is correct. Has the city conducted uh, its own capital needs assessments of this property? We did an evaluation at the outset of the project of the rough estimate of what we thought was necessary, but that was several years ago, and we took a series of competitive proposals um, out to the market, and we had individual development teams also provide specific analysis of what they thought was necessary to improve the facility. And what was, what was that figure? You know, I'll provide the specific, I, I don't have the specific figure in front of me, but I can allow the BFC to enumerate the specific costs associated. Well, BFC is a for-profit private developer. I, I like That's to know correct. what the city's assessments was. I'm happy to provide that number to you after. I don't have it in front of me. Uh, the reason why that's important is because this is something that, you know, um, the city, you know, the figure is critical because we could have figured out during the budget process what those capital needs are without going through this entire process right now. Mm -hmm. And to see how this process could have been shaped in a different way with, you know, with the community really uh, at the forefront leading the entire process. Um, I'd like to go into the RFP. You had talked about that there was a certain uh, criteria that was designed by EDC for the RFP. Is that correct? That you, uh, EDC yes. designed the RFP? Yes, prior, yes, that's correct. Uh, is this the current EDC or the last, this was the current administration? So no, the, the original RFP was released in 2013. Um, however, after it was released, um, there was concern from the community and this administration took a pause for over a year to conduct an extensive community outreach process to ensure that what was in the RFP was actually uh, was that the sorry that the respondents to the RFP that their proposals were modified and ensure that they actually address the real needs of the community based on that extended community outreach process. So, so you're saying that the community, and I imagine the elected officials, did they help shape the RFP? The the the, you know, I, I can't speak to what happened before. Um, 2014. What I can speak to, because quite respectfully, I don't think I've heard any elected official or any member of the community say that we want luxury condos as part of this plan. Right. And so, uh, if yes, so as if, if you're saying the community was engaged and there was outreach done, how did that slip into the RFP? Right. So again, th this this started with. Um, uh, of a request in April of 2013 from Congress members Clark and Jeffries, who requested, uh, as well as local elected officials, who requested that the city go issue an RFP for this site to ensure that it was redeveloped into, uh, a, into a community. Right, center. and my question, what, what was the engagement with the community and, and elected leaders once the R, when, when the RFP process was being designed? As, you know, as I said, I can't speak to what the previous administration did. What I can tell you is that this administration took, a, took real community feedback and spent close to a year and a half engaging prior to making any designations on this to ensure that the feedback 
um, from the community was incorporated. What we did hear was that there was a willingness to use market rate housing at that time to cross subsidize and ensure that the most important priorities were met, that of the recreation center at affordable rates, which is exactly what this facility provides, as well as affordable office space. I recognize there are real concerns from the community at this time relating to the affordable housing piece. We've heard those concerns very clearly from Council Member Combo today. We take them very seriously. But what I'm trying to understand is that you're saying that the last administration in 2013 yeah. designed the original RFP. When this administration took over, there was this robust community outreach plan. But did the current administration have the discretion to scrap that RFP and start this process entirely over again? So I can, if I can speak, I have a, in front of me a letter from April 2nd of 2013 signed by Brooklyn Borough President Marty Markowitz, State Senator Eric Adams, Assemblyman Walter Mosley, and Councilwoman Letitia James, local representatives, which says, uh, uh, the, our report recommends the facility be developed as a multi-purpose community center, leveraging private market rate housing development potential at the site to help offset construction and operating costs of the facility. So it was clear that that was, in fact, something the local community was amenable to. I hear your concerns, but this clearly was something that the community was focused in on that time. I recognize the legitimate concerns, but the, as a result, we took a pause and evaluated the community feedback on the specifics of the proposals based on the broad framework that was provided um, in this letter from the local But I, I just respectfully tell you that there was recently a, a press conference by the current borough president and the current council member expressing concerns about the same things you, you, that you were just reading. So I, I, just, I just want to just get further clarity. Now, in the criteria, you had mentioned that uh, one of the goals is to preserve the historical character of, of the structure in terms of the neighborhood. Quite frankly, uh, I know my colleague represents Crown Heights, but the people of Crown Heights establish the character of the neighborhood. They establish the area. Um, it's, it's not the market. It's the people, you know, the people who live there, the people who have raised their families, their kids, who sacrifice, they make the neighborhood desirable. They make the neighborhood good. It's not some plan, it's not some person with a, fa a fancy PowerPoint presentation saying, look, look at this shiny thing. Um, I'm curious about the RFP structure because I keep hearing my colleagues ask the same question, but I'm not getting a clear answer about why a nonprofit uh, developer was not selected because my concern is that many times, I could speak as the Sandy chairman, that we created a housing recovery structure that was prohibitive to, to the nonprofit developers getting involved in Build It Back. And I'm just curious to know, was the RFP process prohibitive or restrictive for a nonprofit developer to be involved in this process? No, it was not. You're saying it was not? It did not no, it did not preclude a not-for-profit developer from responding. Because I imagine we're gonna hear from, no we're gonna hear from some nonprofits. And I, 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 I'm very curious to, to, to hear their take. Uh, I, I believe that one of the things that should have been in concrete stone in the RFP process was complete affordability uh, that reaches the needs of the community. Um, now, is there an estimate, I'm, I'm going to move on, uh, is there an estimate for the amount of government subsidies going into this project? So at, at, at this time, as I mentioned, there is, no, there is no subsidy going into the project apart from the provision of this large-scale facility um, at a n relatively nominal annual cost. And can you share with us what is, what is, the, what is the, the sale that they're getting like, as far as uh, the, the, the savings? It's, can you – I'm just not sure I understand the question. You're they, saying that they're getting it at a nominal cost, is that correct? Yes. So oh, sorry. what is, what, what are they potentially saving? Uh, what is the price? You have, you so have right. so the, the de, you're, you're saying the, the developer, yeah. Right. So the developer is, pay, is paying an annual um, payment of up to $2 million a year to the city. However, a significant portion of that uh, can be rebated to the extent there is specific evidence of identifiable community benefits that are provided. That's going, you're saying $2 million a year to the city? Yes, to EDC on behalf of the city. To the, to the city? To the city, yes. Is that getting redirected back to the community directly? As I mentioned, yes. The, the, that uh, 
a substantial portion of that is uh, ref refundable or abatable b uh, based on the provision of specific community benefits, affordable community office space, and you know, affordable rec center space. Yeah, well, I, I, I think that some folks here have very, very valid concerns about you know how how this gets translated into help to them. But I, I, I have a your your presentation has the breakdown of the units. And you had mentioned in your testimony that the, the AMI of the neighborhood is, is it 42 percent? Is that correct? Is that what no, you mentioned? It's, it's, it wasn't in my presentation, but afterwards, yes. It's 50 percent AMI or approximately $42,000 is what Council Member Cumbo alluded to. Because if you look <coughs> at the breakdown of, of the rentals, you're basically saying that <coughs> over th almost 300 or so of the 330 rentals are all over the area's uh, median income. So when people are asking the question, affordable for who, th that's what we have to ask here too. Yeah. Who, is this, who is this actually affordable for? And I think that's why um, you've heard uh, the, the mayor express a willingness to consider putting city housing subsidy into, these pro into this project. I think it is critical because that's where people have very valid concerns that the major overwhelming majority of these apartments are not affordable to the folks who have the average median income there. That, that's a serious issue. And as far as the condos, now the city has a program that I, I know I've worked on to get uh, down payment assistance for folks, first time home buyers, folks who are working families, because it's very hard to uh, afford to, uh, to buy a property. I, I actually believe that one of the ways we have to help combat gentrification, which is a very real issue, is to help people who have lived in the neighborhood, raised their families in the neighborhood, to help them own a piece of the neighborhood. It's not, a, it's not enough to just simply say you should, you should live in New York, you should own a piece of New York. And we should do all that we can to help assist families to own that piece. And so I am deeply concerned about this, this uh, luxury condos, market condos. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to restructure this? And I'm sure my colleague you know, has been working on this to make it a, a home ownership opportunities for local residents uh, at affordable rates with down payment assistance. Is that something that, uh, that your EDC is willing to engage in? You know, we're, we're, we are willing to engage in and have been engaging with the local community uh, their, you know, about their concerns about this project, which do incur, in, include real concerns, which Council Member Cumbo articulated earlier in this hearing about the provision of luxury condos within the project. So we're absolutely open to all ideas and look forward to reaching a more positive outcome for the community on that aspect. Yeah, I mean, I, because it's, you, have conflicting you have conflicting messages here. Uh, on one end, the administration comes to the same community board and the same district and says, we have to open up a shelter to help uh, those in need. And now you're saying uh, there's a, a luxury condo affordable uh, <coughs> crisis. Uh, who's asking for luxury condos? That's, that's the, no one's asking for it. And, and quite frankly, uh, if, if, if it's an issue of, of subsidies or assistance, if this is city property, let's, let's help this community out. Crown Heights needs and deserves assistance. It needs help. It needs some investment. Hey, look, we, we've, we've spent, the budget has increased significantly over the last couple of years. There's money to help Crown Heights. Uh, now, I, two last items I have. Uh, as I mentioned before, I think gentrification is real, um, and I think that this is a project that I'm sure you know my colleagues has, has expressed this concern, and so have others, with regards to what this could potentially and will do in the surrounding area around it. Uh, it could rapidly speed up gentrification. It, it could really impact the area. Is there a neighborhood stabilization plan in the works to make sure that the residents who have witnessed uh, the challenging times and now the evolving times are the residents that will remain throughout time in Crown Heights and not be forced out due to market forces. Is that something that EDC has engaged the elected officials and community about, a neighborhood stabilization plan? Yeah, so the, you know, the <clears throat> broadly speaking, uh, this, is a, this is an issue of significant concern in Crown Heights without a doubt. It's also a concern, frankly, across the city um, you know, I had an opportunity to, to 
to have a tour with Congresswoman Clark of the neighborhood, and I certainly have seen all of the development that's happening there, and I understand the real concerns from residents about that. We at EDC take that very seriously, as does the mayor. But the, the mayor has committed an unprecedented level of resources to address this issue, not just specifically in Crown Heights, but across the entire city. That's 300,000 units of affordable housing, as well as free legal services to ensure that tenants have legal protections when they're at risk of eviction. And finally, you know, two consecutive years, or the first, sorry, the f two consecutive years of the lowest rent increases in history, as well as a year of a rent freeze, which was unprecedented. So across the board, the administration is taking a series of steps to address these issues, um, including continuing to build more and more affordable no, but housing. Sir, I, I say this respectfully. I think in Crown Heights, to some respect, has been the epicenter of the gentrification uh, uh, process and crisis. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have to double down, triple down with resources and attention and focus to the Crown Heights community. Uh, this is a very serious project that has ramifications even beyond Crown Heights. This is a project that we're watching from Coney Island, that we're watching from all over New York City, because what happens here could shape the process and affect folks across the board. So we all are with Crown Heights on this issue. We're all with uh, its community and, and its leaders. I believe there needs to be a doubling down on a neighborhood stabilization plan to protect the very people that are threatened the most and are at risk of this project. Um, and I, I will join my colleague in pushing very hard for that. Uh, the last thing I'll, I'll go into is you mentioned that CAMBA, which is a reputable a, a good group, uh, I, I do have to say, uh, will be involved in the project and other nonprofits. Now, right now, we're experiencing a time where the budget we haven't, thank, thankfully, hopefully we never have to talk about cuts. What happens when the economy sours? What happens to the operating budget of the armory then? Well, you know, that, that is why um, a portion of the project, it does depend on an element of income from the market rate housing to help pay for the maintenance of the facility. That's part of the reason it was initially structured this way. But these are based on estimates, is that correct? These are all estimates. Is it projections? Is it projections? As we've learned in government, estimates, projections are always off. Mm -hmm. it's, I've never met one estimate that has been met. <laughs> in government, we've learned that very quickly. My concern is what happens if our economy takes a turn? We, we have a federal budget right now that is completely favoring the wealthy and, and the powerful, not helping those who are struggling to make it. Uh, if a budget passes in Washington that hurts our state and city, what happens to the armory's operating budget? The I'm, I'm not sure that I totally understand. Can you clarify your question? The question is, you have nonprofits that will be operating inside this facility. Is that correct? These yeah. nonprofits, how do they how do they keep the lights on? How do they pay the bills? So, I mean, I, so you're are you suggesting that not for profit is not helpful? I just want to make sure I understand. I'm trying to I'm trying to ask what what is the funding mechanism to keep the lights on in the in the center and the recreational yeah, facility, right, that, how is that going to be stable? As you know, as I mentioned, it is it is uh, the maintenance and operations. We've carefully evaluated the numbers, and we believe that it is dependent on, you know, some income from the market rate housing in order to be able to support the operations of the um, of the of the rec center. And I think you know. I, 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 I will say, I mean, I think that what the risk you're talking, referring to is one in which rents are going down in Crown Heights, which I think would be a crisis some people in Crown Heights would be happy to have. No, my concern is if the city says we don't have the money to fund nonprofits the way we, we have been in the past, yeah. what, what, what happens then yeah. to their prices? What happens to, right. to their ability to keep the, so, the lights on? So just one more one more point on this, which is that our you know our our lease our agreement with the developer requires that all of these things be provided permanently. In the event that they are not provided for the duration of the lease, they're subject to put significant penalties. But I'll let if you want to ask. As, uh, thank you for that question, Council Member. Um, Eric may want to join in, but just to give you an example of two of the organizations we have that we hope to be housing in the in the in the improved rec center. One is Imagine Swim. They run 13 pools across the city right now. They're reliant on uh, on fees for lap swimming, fees for swim lessons, lifeguard uh, courses, uh, and they have a they 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 this is how they this is their business model. 
part of our deal with them is that they have to provide discounted swim lessons, lap swimming, all their services have to be discounted for local community members, but they're not reliant on public sources to be able to pay the rent. The other example would be New Heights basketball. New Heights is uh, totally privately funded uh, uh, through a series of major donors and supporters that they have developed over their 12-year history. So the, in these two instances in there, like uh, let's consider them our anchor tenants, are not at all reliant upon public, uh, upon public support. So, so that's okay, but you're saying they're reliant on private donors and private sources, is that correct? And, yes. And, the, and they're not drying up? Uh, no, they're doing very, very well. They serve the needs of children. I and just want to make sure that folks here, period, don't get gypped. I want to make sure that folks, because look, we had a, we had a YMCA built. I'm, it's a different organization, and I, I credit, but not everyone could afford uh, some of these pricing structures. And you want to make sure that, that this, this is a facility that is for the people yeah. that live directly mm -hmm. there. The last thing I'll say in the interest of time, I think the chair has been very kind with time, mm -hmm. uh, is the issue that I hear uh, there was talk about local hiring as far as the construction and operation. Do all of those protections, do all of those requirements apply to subcontractors and sub subcontractors and sub sub subcontractors? Because we've seen in this process that a contractor might commit, but the subcontractor might not commit, and it's not bound by those same rules. So, what is the protection? that goes across to every subcontractor that might be involved in this process, and are those subcontractors from the community as well? Okay, sorry, let me go ahead. James, Thank you go shall ahead. I? Okay, so, um, uh, so my company has been doing this for almost 40 years, uh, and we have relied uh, substantially on the local communities to provide support, labor support, labor pool to our projects. It's become a much more formalized process over the last 10 years, and we're very actively involved in it. We recruit from our communities, and we, we, we not only recruit, but we do workforce training within, the, within our communities. We have a 25% requirement, an NWBE requirement, on the card contracting of all hard costs, all construction costs, and that would be, that 25% would be garnered from every participating contractor on the job, whether it's a sub or a sub or of a sub. We will look very deeply at everybody's involvement, and certainly we would promote and have been already promoting MWB involvement in this project. I, I would just tell my colleague respectfully and just be aware of this, where sometimes historically we've seen a contractor say that they're bound by something, but the subcontractor is not. And, you know, we have to make sure that I'm not saying that your company, I'm just saying that I've seen this in other, other parts of the city where it's really outrageous. And so all the protections and promises made as far as a jobs plan for the community, that has to apply across the board to every subcontractor because the people of Crown Heights should not just be witnessing uh, this, this development, they should be active participants in building it and living there as well. And with that, I turn back my time. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Now we're going to hear from Chair Greenfield. Thank you, Chair. James, how are you doing today? Great, thank you. Oh, wonderful. Can I ask you a question? Would you mind, can I see a copy of that letter that you referred to, the one from sure. those? We'll send you one. Where we can. The one that you cited. Do you mind if I just it see it for a minute? I'm just curious if that's okay. I won't keep it, I promise. Yeah, yeah. Just has some notes on it. Yeah. I will not distribute your notes either. <laughs> I promise either. Thank you. Okay, so question, just because I think it's helpful to be fair to all sides, you were not the president of EDC in 2013 with this, when this first came off the ground, is that fair? That is correct. What were you doing in 2013? Um, I was working at the Urban Investment Group. All right, there you go. So this wasn't your project, this started in the Bloomberg administration, correct? Correct. Okay, so let's talk about that, because I think it's just helpful to sort of get some context over here. What happens when there are projects that start in one administration, new administration comes in, do you guys try to tweak those projects? Do you try to keep them the same? How much flexibility do you have in tweaking those projects? Give us just a little bit of background and just sort of for our understanding how a project like that would work. And this project, at the end of the Bloomberg administration, mm -hmm. new mayor comes in, new priorities. How does EDC deal with that? Absolutely, thank you. So you know, it really, it's, it's, it's project by project. We do have the ability, as long as a project is not closed, we have total flexibility. Um, Unless we have a significant, unless we have con contractual obligations that we have to honor. In this case, there were no contractual obligations we had to honor. Um, 
but we, the EDC at the time, still before I was president, um, the EDC at the time and the de Blasio administration heard, you know, real concerns about the fact that there was an RFP out on the street before there had been significant community engagement. So, in spite, notwithstanding the fact that there was the letter that, that you're looking at at the moment from elected officials in the community. That is why um, it, there was a step back and a pause on making any uh, decisions about the project and there was a close to year and a half engagement process that took place over an extended period, that over that period of time to listen to what the priorities of the community were. Once those priorities were identified, we proceeded with uh, the designation that you have before you today um, and have been discussing it since that time. Okay, so also to be fair, I've read the entire letter right now. I'm not gonna share your notes, not to worry. Yeah. But to be fair to the original signatories of these letters, yeah. if you are the borough president of Brooklyn, you're writing a letter to the capitalist mayor of mm -hmm. New York City in 2013, Michael Bloomberg, you probably would say, right, because you wanna get this project off the ground, it's not unreasonable for you and the state senator and the assembly member and the council at the time to say, hey, let's try to leverage some private resources, knowing that this is what speaks to this mayor. Is that mm -hmm. a fair point? Sure. Okay, so I'm just, I'm just yeah. pointing out that just to be fair to those folks oh, who absolutely. signed. I've signed many letters in my time. I don't want a <laughs> future EDC president whipping one out and being like, bam, this no. is what you said. No, no, so no. no. I'm, all, I'm I, only, all, I'm, I'm, all I'm pointing out, James, is in the yeah. context of the time, it makes sense that for them to urge that mayor, who we know is not big on city subsidy necessarily, to move the project along, it made sense for them to say, let's cross-subsidize it. Yeah, without that, a doubt, I was only responding to the council member's question that no one from the community had ever suggested that market rate housing um, could be used to cross-subsidize. So I was just pointing out there actually had been those indications. Fair enough. But I totally accept the fact that, you know, everything is in context and we need to continue to evaluate projects as times and reality on the ground changes. Great. So just a couple of, just honing in on a couple of those questions. So it seems like folks still are happy with the concept of a broader community facility, right? I mean, subject to it being affordable to the community and to the council members' concerns about other folks not coming in. But there are some concerns, and I just, once again, I'm trying to understand the history of it and then perhaps what we can do now about it, about a couple of specific things, and I just want to focus on that. So the market rate condos, was that done as a financing mechanism? Why condos as opposed to Rentals, you know, mm -hmm. rentals in theory could go back. Rentals yeah. in theory could one day be subsidized. Once something is sold, it's sort of gone uh, in the ether forever. Yeah. So was that really more of a financing mechanism yeah. that was, I mean, what was the thinking on why it would be market rate condos so, so, instead of having it just all be rentals? Sure, absolutely. So the, the, the condo piece originally, the original thinking was that it was sized to be as small as it possibly could be, but still provide enough proceeds from the condos, which are the only element of the project, as you say, that has the ability to be sold and therefore generate value up front. So that was sized to be as small as possible, but still be able to cover the cost of renovating the rec center so that it could be provided to the So community. it was a financing mechanism, essentially. Sure. Okay, so it's not inconceivable that today, considering as many councilors have pointed out, that the city has invested, to your credit, Mm -hmm. uh, just last year, the mayor bumped up $2 billion for the capital fund for uh, HPD. I heard Molly Park talk about this morning, so it's ringing in my <laughs> ear at a city and state forum yeah. that we were both at. So it's not unreasonable to say that perhaps there are other financing mechanisms that may be available in this administration that were not available when this project originally got off the ground. Is that fair? Yeah, and actually, as, as, I, as I mentioned, the mayor has indicated an openness to providing you know, city capital subsidy to this project in order to, you know, putting it into the conversation to help improve the affordability mix for the community. Great. Good stuff. Excellent. Okay. So next item is the uh, percentage of affordability. So by our account, and by our, I mean our, I mean my wonderful land use staff who broke down this information for me. So thank you, land use staff, for doing this great work. Uh, there are a total of 390 units when you include the rentals and the sales, of which uh, only 18% of those units are affordable below 110% AMI. Now, considering, once again, that's, that's the count that we have over here. Your count, I'm looking at, you guys break it up versus rental versus sales, but even under your numbers, it would be roughly 20% are at the below 110 percent. Is that, is that correct? That's correct. I mean, we're debating two points, but it's roughly the same because you're talking rental units and I'm including yep. our land use staff. I think they're correct when they're including the market rates as well. So it's roughly 18 percent. Is it fair to say that in today's market, right, setting aside where we were three years uh, back in 2013 when that would have been considered to be uh, aggressive, here we are five years later, is it fair to say that this traditionally, this is not as much as we'd like to achieve when it comes to the percentages of affordability? 
in terms of the lower AMIs? The, well, I can tag Jordan for you. He's sitting right over there, and he's always excited to hop in as an HPD guy, if that's right. helpful. Well, I, was, I would say it's, it's, I'm happy to let HPD speak, speak to this. I would say it's project by project and community by community in terms of the affordability mix, but there's no question that the mayor has made it a priority to ensure that there are a significant number of units provided at projects that are at lower income levels. Okay, sure. I just want to actually point out as well that under the mandatory inclusionary housing that we all passed together, you were back in yep. Deputy Mayor Alicia Glenn's office. You did outstanding work on that. I Thank remember you for that. Thank and you. Jordan and I worked on it. We worked with all the agencies. In fact, we could invoke, just so that I'm sure you know, but just reminding the folks who are watching at home, we could invoke option one, which means that as a requirement, we could simply require that it be 25% of these units be at 60% of AMI or below, right? I mean, so just to be fair, mm -hmm. the landscape has changed significantly, which without, yes. without even negotiating, we could simply say, we're going to go for option one, and we're going to automatically jack up 30% more units on those lower AMI. Yeah, Is that no, something that you well, acknowledge as well? But yeah, there's no, I mean, the, the mandatory inclusionary housing is a, is a tool that has been added certainly under this administration, and thanks to your leadership and help uh, as chair of the Land Use Committee. Uh, and it certainly, depending on which option you choose, could lead to a higher affordability. As it happens, this is selected uh, MI op MIH option that requires that 30 percent of the floor area be um, restricted at 110 percent of AMI on average. So it's a different option. But if you chose a different option, it would impact the mix. Yes, that's correct. Okay, just pointing that out as well. Mm -hmm. So I think I think the point that I'm really I think the point that I'm trying to make is and I just want to be fair to everyone involved is that. Five years is a long time, yes. different mayor, different priorities. You had an administration which didn't invest as much in affordable housing as the administration is. And I think that folks who are looking at this project right now under the new lens are saying, hey, we don't want to look at it from the old lens, right, which is the lens of here's what was good in the Bloomberg days, which quite frankly in the Bloomberg days, just to get this off the ground to the credit of, I actually give Marty Markowitz and Eric Adams and Walter Mosley and Tish James credit, they got a project that wasn't moving off the ground. Kudos to them. Everybody yeah. knows how difficult that is to do. And I think that now that we're in this new reality where we are investing and we're seeing these new resources, I think that's what you're reflecting. So I, I just want to be fair. I don't think the frustration is necessarily at the folks uh, at, at this table. It's just that things have changed. And all we're asking for is that the project should change with the times. And it seems like you're saying that it can change, right? The ability is there that we could deal with the condo issue. We could deal with the affordability issue. We could have additional subsidies, right? So the, the ability to change this project and make it into a better project that really reflects how we do things today, I think is something that is doable. Is that a fair statement? It, absolutely. And we've heard from the council member and the community that it, there need to be certain changes. And, you know, also you're accurate. The, the mayor certainly has you know, concerns about uh, ensuring that we are not causing, you know, a really heartfelt concerns in communities around displacement and gentrification. Okay, final point. Is it fair to say that going forward for EDC projects, you're going to take the current model into consideration on the on future RFPs of these kinds in terms of the feedback and the current standard that we're dealing with, which is very focused on affordability levels as opposed to the Bloomberg model? I'm asking this in your capacity as a president. No, of course. I understand. Yeah, yeah. We, we absolutely will put the de Blasio administration's lens on everything that we do. All right. I appreciate the clarity. I thank you very much. And I will return this letter to the clerk. Non-photographed. Non thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Greenfield. Uh, Councilmember Mealy, questions? Yes, I just have a few statements, really. Um, I just heard you say that you're very flexible on this project also. Um, and I was calling, um, trying to see now. The remainder of this course, you have credits and um, subsidies, including state, regional, council funds, DHC funds, right? Rezo A funds. Did the council member give you Rezo A funds already? Oh, okay, so it's not yet. Okay, and the borough president developer will re um, responsible for opening. Um, funding, additional funding. How much funding will you get from the borough president? We have a capital request for $2 million. $2 million. And I'm looking at the community board nine disapproved vote of 35 to zero. And are you telling me you got this land only for a dollar, right? 
No. No, that's that's. No, you got just a disposition for a dollar. Oh, oh. The, the the overall project is the car the, the 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 overall project is primarily subject to a ground lease, which is a, a rent of approximately two million dollars per year. Did you not get the land for a dollar in a disposition? Yes or no? No, we are not. We're getting the we're 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 entering into a long-term 99-year ground lease. The opening rent is two million dollars a right. year there. to the city the, of New but York. Just, but but you're correct Talk that there's no you're you're correct that the the, the thank the, you. The, I'm just I'm just clarifying the, the portion of the a portion of the project is a is a is a condo piece that's currently contemplated, which we've been discussing, which is being disposed of for a dollar. You're correct, and the remainder of the property. This is already city land, and you telling me. We still cannot do affordable housing on city land. This is taxpayers' dollars. And you got it for a dollar. And who bright idea was get for a 99-year lease? If you got it for a dollar, why would you have to have a 99-year lease? And it definitely could have been into, went into a land trust, yes or no? That we can really secure the future of Crown Heights for the community in a land trust. Uh, well, uh, and another thing, I never heard who said that we needed condominiums in Crown Heights. Sure. So, uh, um, Chair, was that ever answered? So, well, who requested condominiums? No. The, do you want to take that? <laughs> no. So, the uh, uh, council, councilwoman, I, I appreciate your questions. Um, just to just to go back, there's two separate elements. There is a disposition. And then there is a ground lease. They're they're separate, so they're they're different elements of the project. I I absolutely understand the concerns about the condos, which we've been discussing. Councilmember Cumbo has been very clear about her concerns about those, as has the community. And as I mentioned earlier, it's causing us to the mayor and the rest of the city to reevaluate our policy about whether we should ever be providing condos on city-owned property. So we take the concerns very seriously, and it's an element of our overall policy that we're reconsidering as a result uh, largely of the conversation around this project and the advocacy from the local community. The advocacy of the local community are requesting condominiums. No, the, no they're, they're, they're expressing real concerns about the condominiums, which is why we are reevaluating whether we should be doing this on city-owned property going forward at all. And the, um, I'm looking at what the community board had asked. Are y'all open to stop this Euler process and restart with a new plan, yes or no? Uh, you know, again, that is not our intention at this time, but we are certainly open to continue dialogue the with the community and the council for members. That. If the community is requesting that, it's no way this can happen. The again, the because it's is a an big ongoing statement, forty-five to zero disapprove of this project. Understood. So, is no way you can. Start over. We're not contemplating a new ULERP at this time, but we are in ongoing conversations with the council member and the community about what it's possible that could be improvements, significant improvements to this project. Okay, could I ask another thing? The developer will provide between a half a million to and 1.5 in annual community benefits at the recreation center in the form of free and discount access to the facility and programs. Do you know how many will really be free, or it's just hit and miss? Well, the, 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 I will let BFC speak to the specifics here, but it, it's, it's not hit or miss. There are certain elements that are going to be very specific and laid out in the contract between EDC and the developer, which will have real significant enforcement penalties associated with them if the affordable community space is not provided. I'll let the developer speak to the specifics of the programming. And I have one more question. Thank you. Eric, do you want to talk about some of the uh, programmatic uh, uh, opportunities to be available discounted to community. You want to talk community benefits? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. John. Our, our goal is to maximize the amount of programming and access to the community um, at the Armory. Um, Have you really talked to the community? Regularly. We've hosted... So can I ask one thing? This is Crown Heights. Do you know they like soccer? Yes. Well, we like soccer. Mm -hmm. So no component of soccer is in this either? 
just basketball and swimming? No, no that's, that's incorrect. So the, the proposal includes three components for the recreation center, basketball court, um, a swimming pool, like you pointed out, as you pointed out, but also a multi-court surface capable of accommodating indoor soccer. And we've talked and spoken to multiple um, soccer operators, um, some based out of Central Brooklyn, um, who are very interested in um, in programming at the Armory. And soccer will be a very large component. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I just hope that um, our community. It will not be unattainable and unaffordable for our people to use this facility if it's ever built. But I just hope it stay free to some um, that cannot afford. Gentrification is here. And if we continue building developments like this, people who lived in the neighborhood would never be able to live here again. So I just ask that Maybe you rethink this project, that it could be a component. If it's city-owned land, city-owned dollars, why can't the mayor or the city council put money in to make this affordable housing project? And thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Council Member. Uh, before I refer to Council Member Combo for final questions, um, in terms of your 390 units, total units, Yep. How many of these units are for homeless set aside? At the, and in the current project, there are there are no units uh, for the homeless set aside. There are no units for homeless set aside. <laughs> Yet, HPD, there's a requirement throughout the city of New York that every development that comes in through every project, there's a homeless set aside. Right, well, the, the distinction here again is that uh, in the current formulation, there's no city subsidy being con it's included in the proposal before you. Um, there, are, the HPD does have new requirements around that that pertain when the HPD puts subsidy in, and to the extent that's a part of the project, those requirements would apply. So, James, um, you know, it, it's just mind-boggling that in the city of New York, where you have over 60,000 homeless families. The city is taking city land, mm -hmm. and they want to build over 50% of them at market value, but choose to offer zero units for homeless set aside. Unacceptable. All right, with that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Council Member Cumbo. Thank you, Chair Salamanca. Uh, this council has spoken loud and clear, and they have brought up some very serious questions. Uh, and some very real issues that have to be addressed. Uh, city subsidy, that's critical to a project of this nature. Why is it that with uh, so many districts getting city subsidy for projects, why should Crown Heights, the epicenter of gentrification, be overlooked for city subsidy in order to create real affordability? That's unacceptable. Our community's not going to accept that. We're not gonna accept that. And most importantly, this city council body is not going to accept that a project of this magnitude and scale would not be issued city subsidy in order to make this a reality. We want real accessibility for the community center and recreational facility. That has to be long term and it can't be introductory. I get that we're looking into it, we're seeing. It has to be written so that there are uh, ramifications if it is not accessible or if it starts to uh, bend in that direction. A project of this nature has to have a homeless set aside. In my district, two homeless shelters just recently opened up because we recognize that so many people from the Crown Heights community were being pushed out of their homes and into homeless shelters. And for us not to create permanent housing for those that are in our homeless shelters to return and come back to their home, that's certainly something that is critical and that we need to make sure exists. No condominiums. There can be no luxury condominiums or sale of any aspects of the armory. Each of the members on this panel spoke about that. And while you may say um, you're not looking to reissue another ULERT process, if these, project, if these a aspects of this project are not addressed, there's no way that we could move forward with a project like this. And if it were to be re-RFP'd out again, um, that would have to open up another ULERP. So we need to address these. And I wanted to close by asking two questions. Um, wanted to find out more about jobs 
because this is a very real component. If you don't have a job, you can't live in the community. If you don't have a job, you can't live in the community. You can't get an education in the district in which you live. And also want to ask about the environmental aspects of this project. Um, you have heard about concerns that have been brought up in terms of asbestos that is a uh, been documented to be a part of the Bedford Union Armory. Can you talk about what is the plan? What has been the evaluation? What has the environmental review shown us about asbestos in the community? And how are we going to address that moving forward so that this recreational facility and the housing component is not something that puts our community um, in uh, health issues that um, could be avoided if we address them on the onset? Absolutely. So I'll start with uh, your question about jobs. So this project is going to provide 200 permanent jobs. It's going to provide, uh, the, again, in addition, it's going to provide permanent space for all of the organizations that we've talked about. The fact that they will have real space under long-term leases, many of those are job training organizations. Um, and, you know, we think job, job training as well as uh, starting at the youth level, um, which New Heights Youth is providing, uh, the Digital Girl Coding Organization is going to provide, you know, significant opportunities for training and coding, which is a real job, you know, increasing job opportunity. Um, but importantly, it's going to provide 750 construction jobs. I know I'll let BFC in a moment speak to how they're ensuring that, you know, local members of the communities have access to those jobs. Uh, it's going to provide 20 jobs f uh, through that are going to be contracted th through 32BJ SEIU to ensure that those are good quality building service jobs paying uh, union wages. Uh, overall, the project is subject to a 25 percent MWBE participation rate, um, which is something we at EDC take very seriously. Across the board on all EDC projects over the last fiscal year, we had 30 percent MWBE participation, which is five years ahead of schedule of the mayor's goal of MWBE participation. So we've had very strong success on, on our projects across the board, and we continue to intend to continue that success here. I'll speak quickly um, about the environmental issues, and then I'll let uh, BFC speak. I just to want to interrupt and say that my goal for MWBE participation is 30 percent. Yeah, which is, so. which is ours as well. Okay. And we had 30 percent last year um, in the across the board. If you take all EDC projects, as long as we're clear on that. Yes, we're 100 percent clear. Okay. We, um, uh, the as to your concerns about environmental issues, I know there have been concerns from the community about asbestos at this project. Certainly, it's an old facility. Um, any remediation that's done as a part of the asbestos will be subject to strict federal, state, and local regulations around this. The asbestos remediation would be, have to be a specific plan approved by the City Department of Environmental Protection, would have to be prescribed and subject, again, to very strict requirements. Uh, so the, the DEP takes those issues very seriously. Um, so I'll let the developer speak to a couple more specifics on both of those. Thank you, Councilmember Combo. Our company's been uh, really committed to local hiring for almost four decades. Uh, we now have a, as I mentioned earlier, a more prescribed process. We have to do this through N N Hire NYC, and in order to make sure or ensure that as many local community members as possible get a good shot at these jobs, we are going to invest in and conduct and have Manny Burgos conduct work fairs, work conferences within the community with Eric's help and John's help reaching into the community to make sure as many people who are in need of and wish for a job on our site, we can get them funneled into the higher NYC process. For, for workforce development, it's another area where we're very committed. We're doing a project now uh, on the north shore of Staten Island where we, we're going we're gonna, uh, we're gonna to deliver 1,200 permanent retail jobs. Uh, we have invested, uh, along with your colleague Debbie Rose, uh, in uh, a, a workforce development program to supplement <coughs> higher NYC and SBS services in order to train 800 people in that community to be more competitive within the pool of those who will be applying for jobs. The point is I want to make sure as many people on the north shore of Staten Island get those 1,200 jobs as possible. We make nothing less than the same commitment for this job, both on the construction side as well as the permanent jobs. You know, John, I don't know if John wants to talk at all about the environmental review we did, but... Anyway. 
Uh, as it regards to the asbestos, as, as uh, Mr. Patchett um, mentioned, uh, asbestos is highly, highly regulated by both the federal, state, and city government. We will comply with all federal, state, and city regulations. DEP um, will monitor our compliance, um, and we will be in full compliance with all regulations. I just wanted to say on my end, because we have many people who have come here to testify and we want to be respectful of their time as well, but I just want to conclude my questions uh, and, and comments by saying this is, a, this is a huge opportunity potentially for our community. And I am disappointed that there were not more opportunities for us to hear um, how the city plans to effectively invest subsidy, how they're going to plan to remove the condominiums. All of these things are still subject to question marks. And I've heard a lot of we're looking, we're investigating, we're talking about, we're thinking. Those times are over. We need to understand exactly what this project is bringing forward, exactly how it's going to impact this community, and how we as a community can benefit from a project of this nature. Um, as you've heard from many of the members here, they brought up very serious issues and concerns. In order for something to be voted on by the council, um, you need the vote of the council members. And if this committee um, is asking the types of questions and not getting the answers that they need in order to approve or to vote in support of, this is going nowhere. And so we need these answers. We need to understand what this project is going to be, how it's going to impact this community. And in good consciousness, for, uh, as myself, I've lived in Brooklyn my whole life, all 42 years. My family's been here for a total of 80 years. We are those families that have invested in Brooklyn, New York. We want to remain in Brooklyn. We want families just like ours to remain in Brooklyn. And what we don't want to have is a project that's going to gentrify our community, push us out, displace us, um, through a project that's not well thought out. So these questions are critical. We need to hear answers. And this is not just going to be some rubber stamp project that just gets pushed through the process. We need those answers and will not move accordingly without them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one last question, I'm oh. sorry. Um, EDC, how will you ensure uh, that BFC is not utilizing contractors or subcontractors they have a record of wage theft. They have a that all of the um, organizations that we work with are subject to strict scrutiny, um, and the at the, at the end of the day, the contractors and subcontractors that BFC works with will be you know looked at very closely by the city, um, and you know again we take concerns about wage theft very seriously, and we will not allow that to occur on this project. And, sir, we, we demand certified payroll from all our contractors. Including subcontractors as well? Yes. Yes. All right. Um, and uh, is this project going to be, uh, are you going to utilize labor for the construction or the demolition of this project? This is going to be an open shop project where we hope to have both the construction trades, union trades, as well as non-union trades working together on the job. All right. And then my last question is, have you met with laborers? With? The laborers. laborers. Union. Uh, no, not yet. All right. Will you be meeting with them soon? Uh, yes. I see them every day out in our job in Staten Island. I could meet with them tomorrow. Uh, regarding this project? Yes. So you're giving me a commitment on the record that you'll meet with them? No commitment. Oh, commitment. I'll meet with them? Absolutely. Uh, uh, for this project? I'll meet with them about this project, yes. How soon? Tomorrow. Okay. I see them every day. We employ 20, of their, 20 or 30 of them right now in our job in Staten Island. All right. All right. Well, with that, any other questions from the panel? Well, thank you very much. Thank you. So we're going to bring up this panel here. All right, so do we have a William Howard? William Howard? Yeah, just uh, let them uh, leave, and then we'll bring you up. Shh. Uh, we have a Manuel Burgos. Jeffrey Davis, come, yeah, come right up to the table. Uh, Ted Smith, Ted Smith still here? And I apologize, Kate, if I pronounce your name wrong. Uh, Kate Peralt. Kate?
So uh, where each um, each speaker will will get two minutes to speak, and the sergeant of arms will set the timer, and we'll start with uh, Mr. William Howard. Thank you, Brett. <clears throat> Just press the button. Thank you very much for having us. First, I'd like to. Um, my name is William Howard. I'm president of the West Indian American Day Carnival Association and we present Labor Day in Brooklyn, but before I make my two comments, I'd like to introduce the chair of the board who's been with the organization for the last 50 years, Angela Seeley. Um, Angela Seeley is one of the original members of the organization, has been with the organization for the 50 years uh, that we have presented Carnival in Brooklyn. Carnival in Brooklyn obviously is the largest carnival of its sort in the United States. Uh, we uh, provide um, a carnival explosion and also culture of the Caribbean which involves 32 countries. We are supporting this project because it will give us an opportunity to combine the mass uh, program, the steel band program and carnival itself into one uh, housing area. We need that because in order to continue to present two million people on Eastern Parkway or in the surrounding areas over the Labor Day weekend, we have to combine a lot of our resources as it was said earlier today. We are supporting this project and we are advocating for 3,600 square feet of space which will include the Mass Association which is another nonprofit and the Steel Band uh, association, which is another uh, nonprofit, into one area on the third floor of this armory. So we ask that the city council, in addition to all the other things that you have to do, is to pay particular attention to the nonprofits because we too are not only being gentrified out, but we also are losing any space for the practice of uh, any of our bands. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Manuel Burgos. Good afternoon. My name is Manuel Burgos, and I am the CEO of By the Numbers Consulting Services, an outreach and compliance firm based in Brooklyn, New York. BFC Partners engaged my firm two years ago to begin outreach to MWBE firms and lay a foundation for local hiring in the Crown Heights area. Our firm has been engaged uh, before in these act types of activities, but never before so far in advance. Uh, the Economic Development Corporation has set a substantial MWBE goal for this project at 25% of the total project costs, and BFC Partners wanted to ensure it meets or exceeds these goals. Our work on this project thus far is as follows. Multiple info sessions, for city certified MWBEs with a target on those MWBE firms from within two miles of the project site. These info sessions provided MWBE contractors advance notice of opportunities available, as well as what prerequisite items are required, such as insurance. For non-certified firms, our firm contacted over 300 local contractors in an attempt to determine which firms were minority or women owned. These firms were invited to a special get certified event, putting them on the path to certification well before the start of construction. We also conducted an info session with local service providers, giving these organizations an idea of how local hiring will be conducted, as well as defining their specific role in making referrals and helping with follow up. To date, we've identified over 60 MWBE firms in central Brooklyn. Um, we've also identified a half dozen local service providers for local hiring partnerships. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Burgos. Uh, Mr. Jeffrey Davis. Great, great, great. First and foremost. Just press the button on the mic, yeah. All right, thank you. First and foremost, I'd like to acknowledge my brother, Honorable Councilman James E. Davis who was killed in this chamber right on the balcony 
uh, in 2003. It's very important. Councilman James E. Davis, rest in peace. Uh, my brother and I started an organization uh, roughly 25 years ago called Love Yourself, Stop the Violence. Uh, in that time frame, we've held GED programs, art exhibits, documentary screenings, peace walks, computer training, visited countless schools, and given out scholarships you know, with our own money. In the last 15 years since his death, we've continued to do that, uh, providing these services and doing the best we can in the community. Just recently, around the Bedford Union Armory, uh, there were some shootings, a number of shootings, right there on Bedford Avenue and Union Street, right in front of the Armory. Again, down the block is the Ebbets Field, and then you have the Tiffley Towers. And in Prospect Leffert's Gardens, there's a lot of gang violence that's spiking up. We've been trying to address that the best we can. It's changing. Things have changed, and time has changed with the housing crisis, and we have to address that. And I trust my council member. Great questions. I trust my council member to be that voice to address that and deal with the housing crisis because that's very, very important. But we also have to deal with, continue to deal with this violence crisis that takes place in our community. Um, the recreation center can definitely, all throughout as a known fact, uh, reduce violence in a community. Um, and we need that recreation center to reduce the violence, I feel. So we're going to stay on target. My mission statement is to address violence, and I'm going to stay on target and continue to do that. And again, I trust my councilwoman and the, uh, my colleagues and uh, councilman district leader, uh, Traeger, and, and, and District Leader Mealy, Councilman Mealy, to, uh, to, to address this housing crisis, because it is a crisis, and it's very important. So I trust that we will get that job done. But let's get that recreation done as well, Recreation Center. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ted Smith. Good afternoon, council members. Um, my name is Ted Smith. I'm the executive director of New Heights, a youth nonprofit organization uh, that's been mentioned before. We hope to be one of the operators um, in the new Armory Project. Um, we've been a nonprofit since 2005, um, and since then have been working with children and families um, holistically to try and improve their lives. Um, we currently work with over 250 youth, boys and girls, from fourth grade to 12th grade, and use basketball as a hook to engage them in academic and leadership development and serve as a high school and college prep program. Um, we operate after school, on weekends, and we run a six-week summer academy. Um, I'm proud to say that you know, since 2005, we've maintained a 100% high school graduation rate um, for our participants. 98% of them are going on to college, um, and I think more importantly, 75% of them are graduating from college. Um, and we're seeing the fruits of that as now several of our alums are coming back and working with us part-time, full-time, serving as tutors and coaches. Um, so I think that's really part of the advantage and excitement that I see for the project and being able to become involved in Crown Heights is to continue that cycle uh, moving forward. Um, for us, like many nonprofits, you know, facilities have been the biggest constraint for us um, to expand our programming and serve more kids and serve them better. So I think we're really thrilled to be involved in this project, to be able to serve more kids. Um, it was mentioned earlier, uh, we hope to serve two times more kids than the 250 that we currently serve. You know, I think our goal is actually to serve you know, 10, 10 times more than that, um, to be able to serve thousands of kids and families um, in Crown Heights and in the central Brooklyn areas. Um, so we're really excited about this opportunity to make a deep and lasting impact in the community through our basketball academic um, and leadership programming and provide that, as we've been mentioning, for free or reduced um, cost. Um, so thank you for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker, we have Ms. Kate. Mm -hmm. How do you pronounce your last name? Pilati. Pilati. All right. Thanks. Go ahead. Um, Mr. Chairman and members of the council, my name is Kate Pilati, and I am the COO of Imagine Swimming. Okay. I'm joined this afternoon by my colleagues at Imagine. I want to thank you for this opportunity to share our goals for the Crown Heights community and its children as it pertains to the Bedford Union Armory Pool. At Imagine Swimming, we're on a mission not only to prevent drowning, but to inspire a lifelong love of the water with as many children as possible. We've been teaching children how to swim since 2002, and have been serving the Crown Heights community for three years. Currently, we have over 300 students from the neighborhood swimming six days a week. We are committed to teaching all members of the Crown Heights how to swim and live a healthy lifestyle. We're grateful for the opportunity to continue to grow this relationship when the armory opens. As an active member of the community, we've been in close communication with PS 161 and Megar Evers Preparatory High School. We're excited to partner with them to implement new swimming programs for their students. They understand the importance and benefits of swimming 
and Imagine is committed to collaborating with them to provide more programming and aquatic education. This summer, we hosted the first ever Brooklyn Swims event for the children of the Ebbets Field Houses. The Makos, our competitive swim team, practice twice per week at the Megar Evers College Pool, and nearly 30 children from the area attend workouts. Upon completion of the Bedford Union Armory, hundreds of children and adults from the Crown Heights community will benefit from learning to swim and will be the teachers to future generations. We'll continue to foster the intellectual, emotional, and physical growth that only the water can provide and that is only made possible by the Armory Pool. We'll provide jobs and a career path for people excited about aquatics in the community. We'll also continue to share our love and knowledge of swimming and inspire our neighbors in and out of the water. On behalf of Imagine Swimming, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to testify before the council today. Thank you. I just have a few questions for some of the panelists. Uh, Mr. Howard, can you talk about um, what annual rent would be for you? Um, if you've calculated that per square foot for a space within the Bedford Union Armory um, relative to the cost that you've been looking at for other spaces, if you have been looking to rent other spaces. Sure. <clears throat> Our current rent um, for one-fifth the space that we are advocating for in the Armory is approximately $3,200 a month. Uh, which we are currently paying on Rogers Avenue, maybe two blocks from the armory. Uh, the space in the armory at $6 a square foot, it will afford us 3,600 square feet of space, which will be utilized by not only West Indian American Day Carnival Association, but for the Steel Band Association and the Mass Association, which is the three organizations that make up the carnival activity over the Labor Day weekend. Uh, and uh, to be frank with you, uh, the bands now have little or no place to practice. And on an average, uh, the few warehouses that is left, it's uh, in the area to eight, ten thousand dollars $10,000 a month for June, July, August, leading into September. So uh, one Is of the Bedford Union Armory conducive for uh, practice of the bands? Uh, yes, there'll be some space there available for that, and we'll have a uh, conference area where the bands can alternatively uh, use it for you know, special occasions and things that uh, they traditionally do that uh, we cannot get uh, housing for them in the local high schools anymore because of uh, other activities that are in the high schools. And at Medgar-Evers, uh, if we use the auditorium, it's on an average of about $3,000 for the use of the auditorium. So there will be space in the armory where we can, in fact, some of the bands can rent space on short-term basis. Uh, that will be far less than what we have to pay now in the CUNY system or into uh, the Board of Education system. Mm -hmm. And just in the interest of time for both uh, heights and imagine. New heights. New heights, yes, I'm sorry. New heights and imagine swim. Um, approximately how many children do you anticipate serving um, or did you anticipate serving uh, should the Bedford Union Armory become a reality? What would be the amount of children that you would be servicing, do you anticipate? And, um, yeah. Uh, and how would you recruit them? That was the second part of my question. Sure. So by partnering with uh, local schools and keeping that dialogue open, we hope to spread the word um, and incorporate programming for everyone. Um, our goal would be to reach um, 1,000 children per week. 1,000 children per week. Uh-huh. And for New Heights? And for us, you know, I think our goal is to serve over, um, you know, 4,000 youth and families throughout the year on an ongoing basis through camps, clinics, um, tournaments, events, um, and ongoing, you know, academic and leadership and, and educational programming. Have you had conversations with Richard Green of uh, the Crown Heights Youth Collective? I have, yes. You have? Yes, I have. And what have those conversations yielded? Because I always believe it's important to have existing relationships with long-term community-based organizations. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, I think for us, it's um, through this process is making sure we know who are the key players and, and that we're going to be impacting youth and families from Crown Heights primarily um, as the focus. Okay. Okay. 
That's it. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, the next panel. Uh, we have uh, New York State Senator Jesse Hamilton. Uh, Ismini Spiliotis. Vaughn Armour. Elliot Roseboro. Just, just go right up to the table there. Yeah. And Mr. Patrick Purcell. Patrick Purcell? Okay. All right, so give me another person. Uh, Elizabeth Adams? Is Elizabeth Adams here? And uh, Esteban Giron. Esteban here? All right. All right, so we'll start with you, Ismini. Uh, yes. You, you'll get two minutes. Uh, thank you so much for um, holding this hearing, and congratulations on the baby. Council. Thank you. Um, so I... Um, I've testified many times with regard to the Bedford Armory, and I wanted to um, echo many of the questions and concerns that the council had, and I want to thank you very much for your questions of the developer. Um, and I just want to, before I start, I just want to say what was really um, disturbing in the conversation was kind of when it's okay to um, change with the times and when it's not. You know, so your question about homelessness and that there's zero homeless units set aside in this development uh, was an indicator that, oh, but that was designed under the old plan. And then when we talk about priorities changing and how the recreation center um, maybe have been a priority six years ago, and then as the housing crisis has exacerbated and Crown Heights has really seen um, major changes, um, that, that housing has become a priority, but we haven't changed with that time. So again, kind of picking and choosing what changes is extremely disturbing um, in this process for, for me. Um, what I really want to talk about is that um, we, this is an opportunity and it's going to be an opportunity lost if we don't actually do what you're asking. Um, and what I'm specifically speaking about is that there is absolutely no reason why this development on public land cannot be 100% affordable, okay? And again, the word affordable is completely meaningless, okay? And I have included um, in... Um, my testimony, real numbers and alternative scenarios that would allow homeless set aside and incomes from 25% of area median income up to 130% of median income, understanding that the neighborhood has in fact changed and, um, and, and you want to accommodate that. What I really also want to talk about, we're in a time of fair housing and we've talked about integrating neighborhoods. And I... You can just wrap up. Okay. Integrating neighborhoods. And the fact of the matter is on public land, we have an opportunity to make sure that the neighborhood of Crown Heights remains economically and racially diverse. We can't control private land. We can control public land. And if you look at the statistics that I gave you in these documents, you will see that there's been a change in Crown Heights, an economic change, a racial change. And I, I don't want to get uh, uh, um, hyperbolic. But, you know, as neighborhoods change, they become whiter. But what we see, I've given you examples of Crown Heights-type neighborhoods, and I've given you examples of kind of historically higher-income white neighborhoods. What we find is that the black neighborhoods are going white and higher income, but the white neighborhoods are not going black and lower income. And so there is, I, I just feel like there isn't a balance being created in the city, and so we have to create that balance, and our place to create it is on public land. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Mr. Vaughn Armour. Uh, good afternoon, Chair and this Council member. I just want to call. Uh, I just want to say that I live in Crown Heights. I'm a member of New York Community for Change. 
and the Councilwoman Laurie brought out the fact that um, the gentrification is going on in Crown Lakes big time. And I'm feeling the effect of it immediately. The Bethany Union Armory and haven't even hit a shovel yet. And I have another developer in my building which my landlord sold to Treetop Development Corporation. These uh, private entities are coming in our community here and build up townhouses, condos, or they go into low, low income communities and they buy the buildings from these landlords knowing that the buildings do need work. So what they do, especially treetop development, what they do, they go into buildings that's built without firewalls where they can get out the apartments and bring them up to market value and bring them out as market value. And then meanwhile in my building, the tenants are organized both buildings and the tenants are standing up against treetop development and indoor management because they come in and they gut out everything. And in the meanwhile, the people that lived there for 30, 40 years, their apartments are nothing to be done on their apartments. And I'll be a fool to go out and organize other buildings and I can't organize my building against these uh, disrespectful, disrespectful landlords and developers. And I want to thank Laurie for standing up against uh, Bear for Bear, Bear for Crown Heights BFC. That's my slogan, Bear for Crown Heights. And um, it hurts, you know. And last year, my companion died for 16 years. My landlord turned around the very next day and asked me and my son, what are we going to do about the apartment where he knows that he can get the apartment and raise the rent. So we need, need, we need to get rid of and sentence like uh, uh, vacancy, the bonus, vacancy bonus for the landlords. We need stronger rent laws. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Elliot Roseboro. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm uh, Skip Roseboro. I'm um, a member of New York Communities for Change. Um, first, I want to ask two questions to uh, Councilman uh, Lloyd Cumbo, uh, the City Council, and uh, Mayor Bill de Blasio. Uh, what are the ongoing benefits to the current residents of Crown Heights? Uh, well, what are the ongoing benefits of this plan to the residents of Crown Heights? And on, I specify ongoing because they disappear. What the, the few carrots that they offer disappear within a few, few years and sometimes sooner. Um, all right, uh, number two, if the local Crown Heights community was given the same exact considerations that BFC developers being offered, uh, this would assure that the sports complex would be built and would be, remain accessible and affordable and perma uh, permanently to the local community. It also would allow nonprofit organizations to have lower than market rates um, for as long as it benefits the community, not until the developer deems it not profitable. So the question is, if this would be done under a community land trust and uh, community control, why would the current BFC plan be better or even considered? The current proposed plan um, would usually accelerate the uh, rents of apartments and affordable uh, neighborhood stores, thereby gentrifying the neighborhood years sooner than if it was not, the project was not built at all. Further, most of the uh, 100 million uh, in yearly profit uh, proposed uh, would leave the community and never be seen again, whereas a land trust, land trust profits would be reinvested in the project and community. As a community controlled land trust, um, excuse me, uh, the community would decide how much would, of the project which should remain affordable, uh, that profits uh, never become part of the equation, and that the housing and sports complex will always be affordable. Uh, let me uh, end by saying that morally and, uh, and as elected agents of the public, you have a responsibility to help, uh, help the community keep control of their community but even more, more importantly, to have control of their own futures. Your responsibility in no way extends to BFC, particularly when it comes to a plan that will destroy Crown Heights as we know it. Thank you. Uh, next up, Elizabeth Adams. Thank you. I ask the council to kill the deal. 
The deal gives away public land to a private development firm, BFC, uh, to build no affordable units, as we've heard uh, affordability appropriately defined, uh, in the midst of our rapidly gentrifying uh, working class neighborhood where soaring rents and unprosecuted criminal landlords are pushing long term residents out and into our harmless crisis every day. All to line the pockets of BFC, whose principal is also a major Trump donor. This deal makes our public land fund displacement, homelessness, and Trump 2020. The city planning board and the mayor and Mayor de Blasio, for shame, like uh, this is no less than New York City modern day redlining. Against Community Board 9 and Borough President Adams' unanimous opposition, the City Planning Commission voted 11 to 1 in favor of displacement, homelessness, and privatization of public assets. Th their absurd argument was that because no one currently lives in the armory, there would be no, no displacement. Um, and such feigned ignorance of what luxury condos do to neighborhood rents is not fooling anyone. Why does the mayor's vision for housing, why is it so pathetically limited? This land is our land. We have 60,000 homeless New Yorkers uh, who need long-term housing, not shelters. Uh, respect the overwhelming position of the residents of Crown Heights and kill the deal. All the nonprofits who spoke in favor, if you value your current clients, understand that they will be forced out by this deal. You will have richer, whiter clients. If you care about the current community you serve, you have to oppose the deal. If you support the deal, you support their displacement. Start over. New uh, Euler, new RFP, make our vision. Don't cave to the sunk cost fallacy. When you go to bed, you can think, I gave myself more work, but I did the right thing. Don't sell us out. Think big. Kill the deal and start over. Thank you. You have questions? Just comment because you asked questions. We don't t traditionally take questions from the panel, but I did want to address the, the questions that you asked as well as the last statement as well. The deal that you've heard that has been proposed here is a deal that I can speak right now for the council. This was not a deal that this council can support. Um, EDC has testified, the administration has come forward. Um, they have not brought forward any elements of this project that we believe that we could support. Um, it's up to them to go back to the drawing board and come up with a substantial answer to the questions that have been brought forward over the last six years. And so we are not going to support a project, as you've said, that is going to gentrify the very community that we're looking to sustain. And as your council member, as the leader of the community, I would not support a project that would push out long-term residents with luxury condominiums, a lack of real low-income housing that provides an answer to the homeless shelter crisis that's happening in our community. And so to that, know that this council is not supporting that project. Know that we have to have real tangible answers and results. Know that the administration has the onus now on them to have heard what has been said and to bring forward real solutions. And even when we hear those real solutions, they may not reach what the community still needs, but we don't wanna have an asset like the armory lost in an attempt to create a recreational facility for the community that the very residents that we built it for will never be able to utilize because they don't live here any longer. So I thank you for your testimony and I thank you for your questions. Thank you. Uh, so the next panel up, we'll have uh, Ms. Lisa G from Canva, Renee Smith, Martin Allen, Ramon Huelta, and Rabbi Eli Cohen. Yeah, I think you go before me, I'm last. Go ahead, 
Okay, so we're going to start with Ms. Lisa G. from Canva. If you can just state your name before you start, and you have two minutes. Press, press the button. Sorry. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to thank the committee for giving us this opportunity to discuss the future of the Bedford Union Armory. Canva is proud to support the redevelopment of the Bedford Union Armory, and we are excited about our role in managing the proposed recreational center and head house space um, which will serve a critical need in the Crown Heights community. As one of Brooklyn's most active nonprofit organizations. Can you speak more into the mic? Sure. Is this better? Okay. As one of Brooklyn's most active nonprofit organizations, we are thrilled to be part of a project that will bring much needed recreational space, community event space, and affordable office space to a neighborhood that has been historically underserved. As manager of the proposed rec center and revitalized head house, our number one goal is to provide a state-of-the-art recreational facility, flexible event space, and affordable office space. This includes encouraging the kind of programming that delivers services and activities that Crown Heights residents want to see in their community. Uh, we try to create holistic programs defined by what the community wants, attract young people's attention, allow them to develop leadership skills, challenge them, and help them to learn something new. While we are excited to be working with several organizations that are already planned to operate in these spaces, we want to be clear that we are continuing to craft the processes and protocols with regard to future programming for the Armory. As we have said many times, we have been and will continue to take community feedback on how they want the space to be run and programmed. We know from our local experience in economic development, education, youth services, and family support that community feedback is vital to the success of any project. That is why we are so committed to continuing to receive feedback and using that to shape our approach to programming the space and working alongside the development team of BFC. We would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, uh, Mr. Renee Smith. Good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Renee Smith, and I currently serve as the Associate Executive Director at Ife Tayo Cultural Arts Academy. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Ife Tayo Cultural Arts Academy is a community-based arts and cultural organization dedicated to supporting the creative, educational, and professional development of youth of African descent in central Brooklyn and its surrounding areas. Ife Tayo leverages arts and cultural learning to increase self-awareness, inspire civic engagement, and provide a platform for self and collective expression. Ife Tayo serves over 2,000 students annually through on-site and in-school programs and an additional 5,000 youth and families through affiliated programs and public performances. Ife Tayo is a Yoruba word that means love is enough for joy, and it captures the nurturing and healing approach to empowering youth and redefining community development. Our programs are culturally sound and they achieve results. Over 90% of our graduating high school seniors enroll in college and 90% of them uh, are accepted to college and are able to graduate with the, assist with the assistance of our Financial Education Institute um, and Individual Development Program. Our students are more likely to engage in community activism and less likely to be involved in violent incidents due to their engagement in culturally relevant activities. And for 29 years, we have served youth ages 2 through 18, adults and their families, and as a result, our families remain engaged in programming on an average of five years or more and through multiple generations. We have been seeking a permanent home located within the communities which we serve for the past 20 years and have had to use creative solutions in order to remain accessible to our families. Over the years, programming has occurred in a hospital, a daycare center, a duplex apartment, and in public schools because we haven't been able to find a more permanent, affordable, and sustainable option due to the increase in commercial rents which makes it impossible for nonprofits to remain in the communities in which they serve in central Brooklyn. May I continue? You can wrap up. Okay. The historical undercapitalization of organizations operated by people of color has now prompted a sustainability crisis at a critical time for under-resourced communities. Especially with our current social and political climate, we believe that affordable housing and community spaces should be the highest priority for authentic service, healing, and, transform, and the transformation of community. We're looking forward to being able to participate in this project. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Mr. Martin Allen. 
Thank you. My name is Martin Allen. I'm a president of People for Political and Economic Empowerment. Uh, I've been to a dozen of these uh, meetings about this project. Uh, I'm for the project, but I'm also for what's fair, I'm for also f uh, for affordable housing. But my main thing is that we work with the hard to employ. Me, myself, I'm ex-con, and I work with ex-cons and, and youth in the community. I, was, I lived in Crown Heights at 270 Crown Street. Uh, right across from Mega Evans. I went to jail from there. I've been in jail half of my life. When I came out, I got to speak highly of people that stepped forward to help me, and that was BFC. When I came out of jail in 2000, BFC gave me a, a, a hand that changed my whole life. I ain't been in jail in the last 17 years, <laughs> and out of my whole life, I was in jail my whole life. So people need opportunity in that community. I know a lot of brothers and sisters that's in Crown Heights still. I'm not in Crown Heights no more. I'm in Bedford-Stuyvesant, but I help people from all communities. Uh, on BFC's projects before, uh, downtown Brooklyn at the Tower, I employed people from Coney Island, Brownsville, Crown Heights, East New York, uh, uh, Whitecourt projects, uh, Fort Greene project, Marcy. So, a lot of these jobs are, this job particularly is going to be prevailing wage. There's a lot of things that's not right with this, with, uh, with the program that's been set up, but the councilwoman is a strong woman. I, I heard her speak on a number of occasions at a number of different town hall meetings. And I just ask you all to sit at the table, work this thing out, because it's people in that community that need it, because it's life changing. It's, it, it might stop someone from going back to prison again, and that's what we, that's what it's all about, to take the kids off the corner. Recreation is one thing, but jobs is most important, especially when it's a prevailing wage. From earning $65 from the welfare every two weeks and getting a prevailing wage job that pay you $41 an hour, you understand? That's a life change, and it gives a person the opportunity to think and be able to make change and use that as a step to Changed his whole life, whether he's a plumber, a carpenter, a welder. I'm in construction, so, and I'm also an MBE, a city and state. But we need to help the people, man, and we got to think about the people that don't have. And building, uh, the a mayor said that he was going to build affordable housing, but they're building shelters and they're building storage houses. So what plan do they have for the people that's really in need? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have uh, Ramon Huerta. Yes, I, um, I've worked for Mr. Allen, and I've been with him for like the last five years. I've worked for BFC, you know, on certain sites that they've had, that they've given him the contracts, and I've done security on certain sites and some labor. Um, they give a prevailing wage. Like, I've done most of my life in prison, and um, like, not to go back, you know, we all need jobs, especially in that community in Crown Heights. Like the lady said, right, there's a lot of young people on the corners, you know, smoking weed or doing whatever. They need to get opportunities to get jobs like I've had opportunity now that I didn't have opportunities in the past or I, I didn't search for opportunities in the past. So, you know, Mr. Allen, he, he goes out and he speaks to certain places in the community and he pulls these. And like BFC may not be perfect. No one is, but y'all keep ironing it out with them and try to come to a solution because they do give out jobs and they do give out contracts to Mr. Allen and his company. So BFC is not, is not like, like the monster that everybody makes them out to be because they do give a prevailing wage. And, you know, that, that helps. That helps a lot from going from welfare, food stamps, or whatever to making a decent wage so that you can feed your family, feed yourself. You know, and um, like I said, no one's perfect. They're not perfect. They're not a perfect company, but y'all keep ironing it out with them. Give them a chance because nobody else is trying to develop that place. That place is going to stay empty and be an eyesore in the community. If they at least try to invest some money into it or whatever and bring us to in there to work, you know, because the last job we had in City Point, Mr. Allen, I'll tell you, we, they hired 50 of us. <laughs> Every day it was, every shift was, um, on the security side was eight, eight guards just on the security besides the labor. So they do work with the community. I'm from the community. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then next up we have Rabbi Eli Cohen. Hi. Thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, congratulations to our council member. 
Um, I'm speaking both on my own behalf as an over 40-year resident of Crown Heights and as the uh, executive director of the of Crown Heights Jewish Community Council, which is the council of synagogues in Crown Heights, which has been in existence for 48 years in the community. And as far as this project is concerned, I want to say that I participated in many of the community discussions that were sponsored by EDC, and we heard the voices of the community asking for exactly the type of facility that is being uh, offered here, uh, the recreational and the community space. And we heard the voice of young people saying that we don't have a roller rink anymore, we don't have a, uh, the movie theaters to go to anymore, even King's Plaza doesn't let kids come in anymore. So they don't have places to be except on the streets, and this is going to give them a real opportunity to have a place to be productive and all these wonderful organizations that are part of it. We have not been given space inside, but we still feel that it's an important benefit to the community, and it's very important not to kill the deal, because if we kill the deal now, when the economy is high, we may not get another opportunity when the economy is going to be down by the time this process goes through another six years, another eight years, another ten years of the place sitting unused and without benefit to the community. And I say this for all the children of the community and the members of our own community congregations, but also the broader community. We are the sponsors of Project CARE. We work very closely with our council member to bring the entire community together. And I can see this space as being a place that brings the entire community together. As far as the housing aspect of it is concerned, I trust the council member that you'll fight for the best deal that we can get. But if we're talking about lack of affordability and the loss of stabilized units, I think we really have to look again at that goal of re renovating and renovating apartments until we get to the 2500 magic. And there are people buying out buildings today in the community to get rid of that affordable housing by continually investing in it and getting the higher rents until they go out of stabilization. So that's really where we can save stabilized houses, and I think you need to work at that. Thank you. Mr. Allen, I have a question for you. So the role that you have played is that you've developed some sort of company where you connect Young men, from, young men and women from the community to jobs on local sites? Yes. I, um, I have people working with a lot of different, Arcadia, uh, BFC, Petroselli, um, Renaldi, uh, Siami, um, and I got a couple of new sites downtown Brooklyn right now. Um, and so bank. you're the, the go-between between the local community and bringing individuals onto the work sites for training to do jobs. Yes, we, we, uh, we teach them, we, we, bring, we go to the street and we get them, and they come to our office and we teach them OSHA scaffold f flagging uh, so that they can have the safety ex ex uh, thing under their belt so that when they go on the job, they know not to take risks because some contractors will put people in arm's way and that's what we don't want. We want them to be safe because Nothing is more important than your life, not even their job, regardless to what you make. So, so then, in fact, you are an entrepreneur and not an ex-con. Oh, I, yes. I, well, I, I guess don't I want you to wear that. that. <laughs> Just wanted to be clear about who you are. Yes. Well, I, the reason why I say ex-con is because uh, parole and everybody else, they send a lot of people that come out of prison to our, to our office to get employment. Uh, we don't get any funds from anybody, city, state, or federal government. Everything that we do, we do because we go into the community, we earn it, we find the jobs, we support ourselves. Uh, BFC have helped us before, giving out uh, turkeys and toys on Christmas for Fort Greene, Farragut, Gowanus, and Wyckoff, and uh, also Best Stuyvesant, and I forgot about that. But the key is, I'm not here just speaking for BFC. I'm here speaking for the people of New York because so much, I agree with you, so much city land has been stolen from the people without mm -hmm. the people say so. But I got to award BFC because they've been sitting down at the table with the community from the beginning trying to work things out. And you've been a, 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 a great fighter in that. I listened to you every time that you spoke at every uh, town hall meeting that we went to. And yes, we should have more affordable housing. Uh, included in that, but for a person to say that they don't need uh, condominium, no contractor is going to build something while trying to make something. You got to remember, they're in the business of making money. But it's all right for you to make money as long as you take care of the community that you're making the money in. I hear you. So, so thank you. Thank you so much. 
All right, thank you very much. Uh, so the next panel we have uh, Jonathan Santos Ramos. Jonathan? You have to leave. All right, Terrence Knox. Terrence? Uh, Justin Sinclair? Justin? Val Henry? Val Henry? That's awesome. And uh, Diamond Calderon. Diamond? All right. Yeah, I'll call you that. And Esteban Giron? Is Esteban here? I believe he was. Wow. And uh, Skip Roseboro. Skip? All right, these left. All right, we're going to start with uh, Justice and Clear. All right. Good afternoon. My name is Justin Sinclair. I'm here speaking on behalf of my union, 32BJ, SEIU. 32BJ is the largest property service union representing nearly 85,000 members in New York and nearly 400 members that live in the community, District 9. 32 BJ members maintain clean, maintain, clean, and provide security services in schools, commercial, and residential buildings, both market rate and affordable, all across the five boroughs, including at projects like the proposed Bedford Courts. Our union understands the need for real affordable housing in Community District 9. The current plan for this development will create 160 new affordable apartments for low-income and middle-class families where there currently are none. We believe that as the project goes through the approval process and is shaped by more input from the community, this plan will only get better. I would also like to highlight that the development team has committed to providing the community with good quality permanent building service jobs. These jobs will pay family sustaining wages and provide good benefits for local residents. The developers have also committed to staffing half of the permanent jobs with low-income residents and to creating a new job training program that will help Crown Heights residents who enter into careers and building service. These jobs can help local residents out of poverty and allow the workers to support their families and to continue to call Brooklyn home. We need both affordable housing and good jobs. As long as there are hardworking people earning too little to afford the rising housing costs, families are going to continue getting priced out of their homes and the affordable housing crisis will continue. Projects like Bedford Courts can provide both. This is why 32BJ supports BFC's redevelopment of the Bedford Union Armory. We need to ensure that Crown Heights continues to be home to families of different income levels. And our union will keep working to protect the diversity that makes this neighborhood great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Val Henry. Good afternoon, Chairman Salamanca, Councilmember Cumbo and committee members. The Local Development Corporation of Crown Heights has developed, owned, and managed low-income, senior, and homeless transitional housing since 1987. We own and operate eight residential developments in Central Brooklyn consisting of 23 buildings with over 700 units of housing. As such, with those years of experience in residential development in Crown Heights and neighboring communities, we are in a uniquely strong position to speak on this subject. In addition, I've been in the community in Central Brooklyn in, in Crown Heights for more than 40 years, and I remember when this subject first came up a long time ago, and there was no one around to do, to do this development. The Bedford Army facilities, Bedford facilities, community space, affordable housing, affordable office space for local nonprofits, all of which are much needed and long sought after, as well as community reinvestment funding or what we get out of this project. We support the Bedford Union Armory, Armory Project because it will provide housing to serve a diverse mix of families, including those at low and middle incomes. As vital as it is to provide low income housing, it is also imperative that new housing is not segregated by narrow income levels that divide neighborhoods and community. History has shown those models are a recipe for disaster. Added to the equation is the additional benefit that the project developers are instituting an affordable housing fund that will continue to build and preserve more low income and affordable apartments in Crown Heights.
part of the um, LDC and BFC partners are committed to the creation of a new affordable housing fund that will invest some of the proceeds from the project into low-income housing throughout Crown Heights. Few of the new large developments in our communities have included significant reinvestment programs such as this. In closing, I, I am also submitting 400 plus letters from uh, community residents in Crown Heights in support of this, uh, of this project. It shows that, this, that the community is not a monolithic community, but a diverse community that needs uh, representation and, and uh, services for all income bands. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, we have uh, Diamond Calero. Good afternoon. My name is Diamond Calderon, and I'm speaking on behalf of Maurice Reed, deacon of the First Baptist Church. Um, over the past 10 years, since rejoining the community effort led by the late Congressman Major Owens to secure local ownership and to develop the Bedford Union Armory, I have spoken to many residents and attended several community meetings in which the community has led, laid out its desire, several, this, its desire to develop the armory in a matter that provides recreational facilities, affordable housing, a home for local, service, local social services, medical services, and cultural organizations and jobs for the local residents. <clears throat> we now have a plan, I'm sorry, we now have a plan before us that goes a very long way towards fulfilling those demands of the community. However, it needs modification. During the new few months, we will expect to see the areas of change that is necessary to assure that the final plan achieves the goals presented by the community. Despite the fact that it addresses most of the elements demand in the past, there are those who are threatening, threatening to turn away rather than fix the development plans. We cannot allow this opportunity slip away. We must do all that we can to assure that the Bedford Union Armory development with necessary improvements will go forward to help revitalize our community. This space has been vacant for too many years, even as Crown Heights neighbor neighborhood groups struggle to find quality, affordable event space. Let's work together to ensure that this development plan with reasonable modifications is implemented in the armory is converted from an eyesore into a sustainable community treasure. The, the proposed recreation center will provide opportunities for youth sports leagues, after school programs, and senior activities that our community so sorely lacks. Free and discounted re, recre, recreational programming, programming will be provided. It will also support anti-violent efforts by providing young people with a safe place to gather, play sports, and build life skills. The center will include three multi-sport courts, three hardwood base basketball courts, and an indoor athletic field and a 25-meter competitive swimming pool. The Armory's Recreation Center will also provide the perfect space for student athletes from our local public schools and young sports leagues. The affordable office space at the complex will provide permanent houses for some of our most important nonprofit community-based organizations, particularly those long-serving groups that have historically supported Crown Heights low-income communities. These organizations serve thousands of people each year but need inadequate facil facilities. The Armory Development will provide that affordable space. These nonprofits will also provide academic tutoring and college prep services that will perfectly complement the after-school sports. The, the program, the project, will also include a 500-seat event space that will be available to local residents and community organizations at affordable rates. This new community space will be an important place for holding performances, large meetings, and other activities that serve the central Brooklyn neighborhoods. Finally, I support the development of the Bedford Union Armory that will provide rental housing to serve a diverse mix of families, including those at low and middle income, middle income levels. Although it is vital to provide housing that is truly affordable to, co to, co to current 
residents of Crown Heights, it is also imperative that new housing is not segregated to narrow income level. However, the project should not include luxury condominiums at the expense of providing more truly affordable housing. Further, we support the plan of the developers to institute an affordable housing fund that will continue to build and preserve more low-income apartments in Crown Heights, and we urge the inclusive of a federal, federally qualified health center to provide 21st century medical services to all of our neighborhoods. In conclusion, completing a new armory will create new resources for the people and organizations that have been in Crown Heights for decades and have made our community what it is and will serve as a template for future sustainable developments. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank all of our panelists. That was our last panel. I want to thank everyone that has been here today, that has participated, that has testified. I want to thank on our staffs uh, Raju Mann. I want to thank Brian Paul, uh, Julie Lubin, Amy Levitin. I want to thank Chair Salamanca, all the members of the committee, and I want to thank all of you for giving of your time. This is a critically important issue. Uh, the future of our community certainly depends upon it, and I thank people for their passion, their concerns, and their ability to create something for the next generation. I also find it very interesting to see who appears to speak up and about the armory and who doesn't before and after an election cycle. Um, it's very telling, it's very interesting, and I'm glad that we're able to move forward um, in a spirit of hearing one another, of speaking to one another, and being respectful in one another um, in terms of moving our community forward. Thank you, Chair Salamanca, and I'll turn it back to you. Uh, thank you, Council Member. Are there any members in the public who wish to testify who have not done so? All right, seeing none, I am now closing the public hearings on LUs 808 through 812. I would like to thank the council and the land use staff for preparing today's hearing and the members of the public and my colleagues for attending. This meeting is hereby adjourned.